No business forgets its first employee, its first paying customer, its first patent, its first earnings call, its first million dollar deal. No business forgets its first move. But for first to continue, businesses need to reimagine, reinvent, and reequip. And no one is better than BMC at creating innovative technologies for our customers so they can achieve first after first after first. Please welcome Senior Vice President, Worldwide Sales and Marketing, Dan Streetman. Thanks, everybody. Welcome to New York, to BMC Exchange, New York City. I'm very excited to have you all here today. I love being in New York City. By most measures, New York City is, if not the best, one of the best cities in the world. And that's why I'm, yeah, go ahead, give it a woo-hoo from New York. New York, welcome. We've got a New York crowd here as well. What's also about being one of the best cities in the world, if not the best city in the world, it also exemplifies why each of you are here. Each of you are here to help make your companies, your organizations, your enterprises, the best digital enterprises in the world. I love the investment you're making in your time. It's important. We're here at a great location here in Time Center. I welcome our full room that we've got here today. I also welcome everybody who's streaming from our overflow rooms around Time Center, and those of you from streaming in your offices or anywhere around the world. We've got a great day in store today. We've got some tremendous keynotes. We're going to do some demonstrations, give you roadmap updates, insights on deployments, and more. More importantly, today is a great day for you to get to know one another, to interact with your peers. Go ahead and look at your peer to your left and your right. Introduce yourself now if you haven't yet. Very, un very tough, difficult thing for a New Yorker to do, right? <laughs> Rode over on the subway, I was like this, don't touch anybody, keep my head down. Today's the day, we're going to get outside that, we are going to be great. As you gather those insights from your peers, also make sure you check in with BMC team members. There's a lot of us here to help you, we'll be doing those breakouts, those keynotes. We want to help. We want to help ensure your success, we want to help you drive that transformation. We also have a great group of partners here today. And I want to welcome them, welcome our partners, and I want to thank our partners who are sponsors, particularly Tribal Genius, Fusion, and Data Trend, but all of them are here. Let's give a round of applause to our partners who've invested in making this possible. It's really great. They're here in the room with us. They're also going to be outside in the partner pavilion, immediately outside our break room. There's also going to be some downstairs outside our breakout rooms. So this is the keynote room around there is where our partner pavilion is. Make sure you visit them. There are a lot of exciting things happening in the BOC, BMC ecosystem. We're driving innovation and we're ensuring that every day we're focused on customer success and our sponsors and our partners are a big part of that. The other thing we're gonna be talking about is innovation across the spectrum. And we're gonna be joined today by our president and CEO, Mr. Peter Leave. And Peter's gonna talk about how digital transformation is really business transformation. How what we are doing in our IT enterprise is changing how we engage with our employees, is changing how we engage with our ecosystem, our supply chain, and our, and, our own, and our customers. It's an important part of what we're doing. Then Bill Baruti, the president of our, our ESO Solutions Group, is gonna share a really good insight into what we are doing to bring first-to-market innovation. You saw this, our preview around being first. We're about helping you achieve your firsts. We are bringing a lot of first-to-market innovation, and Bill's gonna share that. We're also really honored to have Tim O'Reilly, speaking of firsts, uh, Tim O'Reilly was the first person, essentially, to drive the term open source, the first person to drive uh, the term Web 2.0. He's an industry visionary, he's going to be a great keynote speaker, and he's going to talk to us about WTF. Literally, he will talk about WTF. <laughs> More to follow on that. We also have great panelists here today. We've got a tremendous example of industry innovation, driving digital IT from across uh, our customer base. We're happy to have Dan. Chris, Ala, and David here. They'll be sharing an outside-in perspective and inside-out about what they're doing to drive digital enterprise and digital enterprise management across their organization, how they're enabling transformation in their business. 
We clearly know that this is a technology approach, but it's also a people, a process, and a leadership approach. And each of you is here because you're a leader in your organization, helping drive that vision and drive that change. So we're very happy to have panelists here to share those insights and make that happen. While you understand what's going on, the BMC event app is going to be a great way to check out those panelists' bios. You'll also be able to see the entire agenda, so it's fine to pull out your phone right now if you want to. You can download the app if you haven't already outside, or you can enter BMC event uh, in your app store or your, your Android Google Play to download that app. You can log in with your email address and just use the default password, BMC event. It's a great way to log in to follow what's going on. There'll be prizes for using the app, an Amazon tap, but you can also get more information on the event agenda, on our speakers' backgrounds. We'll be doing live polling. You can see the floor plan. So I encourage you to use the app to stay engaged and to engage with each other today. Speaking of engagement, another great way to follow what's going on is to follow us on Twitter. We'll be using the hashtag BMC Exchange. If you want to learn more about multi-cloud, control M, SecOps, service managed excellence, big data, true sight, you can follow those hashtags as well. I also encourage each of us to get engaged. Share your, oh, we jumped ahead there, share your tweets. Uh, make sure that you are engaging, you'll be able to follow others. Use these hashtags, use Twitter, we'll be looking forward to following you there. Speaking of engaging, I'm very honored to introduce an engaging and inspiring leader. Someone who is driving us to bring first to market innovation that's driving your digital enterprise and your digital transformation and ensuring our collective success. It's my pleasure and honor to welcome to the stage our president and CEO, Mr. Peter Leave. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And thank you for joining us. We are delighted to have you here with us at this iconic location. It was actually designed and architected with a mindset around constant innovation. So it's a very fitting forum for our discussion today. We'll spend some time and talk mostly about you, about customers, what we are hearing from customers, what customers are telling us matters most. At BMC, we call this the most important voice, the voice of the customer. We'll also talk a bit about markets, what's happening in markets as markets expand, evolve, change, transition. And notably, we'll talk about technology, what we are doing, why we are doing it, and how we have been innovating and investing and ensuring that our customers are first to succeed. It's been an interesting several months. And I've had the good fortune of spending time with customers and talking about what they're doing and why. And executives have been very eager to talk about their business. And many have talked about the importance of fundamentals. And most of you have lived through or are going through these fundamentals. Our company will be more efficient. We will be more productive. We will make sure we keep a keen eye on costs and we are going to work on beating the competition. Well, all of those things held true 30 years ago, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, and they still matter today. And to be very open, we talk about the same things. But what's different, because it is different today than 18 months ago and 10 years ago and 20 years ago, are two phenomenon that have changed. One of those is the market. Digitization, digital transformation is not simply a tagline. It's not hyperbole. It's real. The other is the customer has expectations they've never had before. So as I was flying in on the United flight, I was thinking about a New York-based company. And this New York-based company I'd known about because Although I think I've lost the accent, I am a native New Yorker. <laughs> Apparently not. But this company was iconic as I was growing up in the 70s and 80s, and frankly, deservedly so. They built great products, 
They became more and more efficient. They did very well on the New York Stock Exchange. And they focused on their competition. And they continued to do so. And it worked. And it was a winning recipe. The problem was their market changed. Now, you might say, well, their market got smaller or shrunk. Their market expanded exponentially. Their market grew. Total available, total addressable market was growing big because we all became users of the technology that they had been ascribing to us for decades. We just used it in a digital format. And while this company was focused on Fujitsu and Canon, Kodak missed the fact that the market changed forever. And I read two days ago that 80 times a day on average, we look at touch or have interaction with our mobile phone, as some of you are doing right now. I'm not offended. <laughs> Tweeting, of course. That's right, I know. Dan keeps you, keeps you up to date on all apps. So this is a major, major transition as the world went to digital photography. And many of us who were not photographers became photographers, but we did not buy cameras and film. Now, we all sort of know this intuitively, but it's a case study in digital transformation being real and substantive and tangible. But there's another phenomenon that's important, and that is the customer is expecting things that they had not before, as is the consumer. So for those of us coming up in the era when many of us did, what do you do? There was one of two answers. I work for a B2B or I work for a B2C. And that sort of satisfied those who were inquiring. But I would argue today, this has been inverted. It's not B2B. It's not B2C. It's C to B. The consumer and the customer is touching the business. And our customer's customer, your customer, has a different expectation. So I'm on the flight. And of course, my mind is racing. And I'm thinking about really how lucky and how pleasant the experience is. And United Airlines gets me there safely, and the pilot knows what he and she were doing. And fortunately, it works. And I'm thinking about the role of these pilots, and its safety, and its efficiency, and it's making sure that everything is smooth. And I'm thinking about, God forbid, this pilot is actually stuck behind the engine of a combat jet, and they're at war, and things have changed. And I draw this parallel as businesses that are running as business as usual are more in peril than they realize. And we discuss this at BMC every day, and we've been discussing it with customers quite a bit. I also think it's important for us as we think about the customer to understand what's happening broadly in markets. And we are eager to understand the monetization of technology, but we're also eager to understand the transition of spend is very telling. And we start at the beginning or the top for us because we are focused on the enterprise. And today, in the enterprise, roughly 1.1 trillion is spent in enterprise in IT around the world. It's a big number. And 70% of that number, about $700 billion, is spent on what we would today call core, largely on-prem. Mainframe, on-prem, as the CIO said to me, we have to keep the lights on before we do all the cool stuff. And that is still very substantive. But about 25% about of that number, roughly a quarter of a trillion dollars, is being spent on this transition, largely multi-cloud transition. And we'll come back to that. Now, the interesting thing about that component is that is growing at about 18-fold what the on-prem side and the core side are growing. So at about an 18% CAGR. So by 2020, we expect that number in multi-cloud to be about 400 billion. It's an interesting transition as it relates to where things are going. And we think there are great opportunities associated with that. And we think there are risks that need to be addressed. It's also interesting because digital transformation technology spend this year, and that I would consider a subset of that broader component, is expected to be over a trillion dollars. 
And there are many subsets to that that are growing at a rapid rate. For example, it was not anticipated that we would see in 2017 over $100 billion being spent in security, in IT. Now we use this term IT and maybe it's becoming more nebulous as well because 50% of IT spent by 2020 is expected to be influenced by the BUs, by the business units. So it's possible that IT spend in the form of CIO ownership may not go up while IT spend in totality grows. It's a really interesting phenomenon. So these are good data points and they all matter, but we don't use that in isolation at BMC to make decisions. We triangulate with what we call the most important voice, and that is the voice of the customer. And we spend a great deal of time asking informed questions to customers and prospects. We want to make sure we understand what matters most as it relates to your business, your business needs. And after doing so hundreds and hundreds of times over the last several months, we came back with some feeding mechanisms that are helping us make decisions. But it's clear that customers are telling us they need help. Help me. I, I had a great meeting with a CIO not far from this very facility about two weeks ago. And we were talking about digital transformation and multi-cloud and AWS and Azure. And he said, you just need to understand, all of that is great, we're doing that, but if I'm really truthful, I don't even know where all my assets are. I don't know exactly what I have. And I think that's more pervasive than some realize. So customers are telling us they need help. Help me identify what I have. Help me take an inventory. I need a comprehensive view of all that I have. And this opportunity to discover IT assets is becoming ever more important as the needs and the expectations are going up. And in some cases, for some of you, your cost structure is not. We're also hearing from customers that they have no shortage of systems, no shortage of applications, no, sh no shortage of stuff. And the question is, how can you help me automate these workloads? How can you help me bring these disparate systems together and ultimately turn data into usable information. Every day we hear about more data. There is only more and more data coming into your organizations, more expectations from your customers, and it gets harder and harder to figure out how to utilize this data in a format that helps and keep it secure. And of course we're hearing customers tell us, I need to transition from on-prem to multi-cloud, but don't let me do so without preemptively knowing how much it will cost. Because in some cases, folks have been surprised. And perhaps most salient and most importantly, please make sure it's secure. It must be secure. And that component, I think, is something that um, has become more pervasive and more of an issue than ever before. We've also talked a lot about what it means to be cognitive. What is AI, what's NLP, what's NLU, all this cool stuff with intelligent analytics and machine learning. It makes for great TV, great articles, great sci-fi, but is it in any way applicable to me or my business? And what customers are telling us is, give me a use case. Give me an actual example of this having some valid merit to my business. And that's been an important feeding mechanism for us, too. Now, we get into other conversations with IT leaders specifically about a group that needs to be integrated in, but also needs to be treated separately. And that's development and DevOps. And how do we make sure we integrate DevOps into the discussion while speaking the language of DevOps? That balance is important. And notably, as we talk about this idea of customers touching business and the consumer having a vote, our customers have told us, we need a great UX, we need a great UI. In fact, we need to digitize the user experience. And IT needs to be at the forefront of doing so. Help us. So there's a lot. We asked, 
we got answers, and many, many, many more. And these elements have helped inform strategic choices and decisions. BMC is growing, our business is growing, and we are growing our investment. Today, as Dan outlined, and you hear from Bill and a series of customers who have been great as partners, we are focusing more at this session about multi-cloud and digital transition. That is not at the expense of core needs and fundamentals that many of us have and many of you have in running your business. We are doing both. and We have increased investment, and as we grow, we will continue to increase investment in solutions, in products, in services, and in partnerships. And we're really, really pleased with partners who are here with us, some of whom have never been with us before, and you can see the mindset of the expansion because that too came from our customers, which is, it's not a solo act. And we'll talk about that. I wanted to highlight a few things that we've been working on, and we'll go into much more detail over the course of the session. One of those that was announced just a week or two ago, we call Discovery Everywhere. And the idea is to hit that very first bullet, that pain point that I don't know where all of my IT assets are. Whether it's on-prem or in multi-cloud, we are covering the gamut. Comprehensive view. Now, I also want to be real clear that when we say multi-cloud, we don't mean a monolithic one-dimensional cloud. So our discovery solution is in an AWS environment. Thank you, AWS team who is here. In an Azure environment, in a Cloud Foundry environment et cetera, et cetera. It's in your environment because customers said to us, we need to be able to see across multi-cloud options, in some cases, your own cloud. And the interesting thing is, it's provided something else that turns out to be really important, and that is, it helps customers avoid blind spots. And that leads to a different discussion. And that emanation point of avoiding blind spots by knowing what you have came up recently with a few big customers who are in regulated environments and want to cry hit. And unfortunately, I think it's fair to say another want to cry may likely happen. And what we learned from this large regulated customer who was very open and honest after going through this, perhaps while going through this, is that they weren't scanning their dev and test environments in their DCs. They said they were, but they really weren't. They were moving to multi-cloud, and we asked them how they secured the cloud. And the answer was, well, the apps team, they're on that. That's their job. But the applications team, no disrespect, we have great applications teams, they're not really in the mode of security. So there were real vulnerabilities. And in their case, not just protecting their own company, but protecting their customers. And so it's been quite a process. Now, I won't betray a confidence and talk specifically about who it is, but I will talk about what we're doing. And what we're doing is multi-tier threat remediation. And we look at this across the chasm, from servers to applications to database, all the way through to networks and ultimately to cloud. And so we came out with a solution called SecOps Response because customers are transitioning to cloud with vulnerabilities and in some cases didn't know they had them. And this gap is dangerous. So this is a business for us that's growing exponentially for obvious reasons. We're also announcing something called SecOps Policy Service. Because constant monitoring of certain areas across this chasm is important, and having policies in place matters. Now, there's a reasonable likelihood that you won't do it for everything. But certain things matter more than others. Payroll. Customer information. We've learned about that, all of us, in the last month or so. And so this is something that we have been investing in. It's timely and we're bringing to you. As we talk to customers about this whole idea of AI and cognitive capabilities and what it means, we've had this resounding theme in our heads, which is a use case is the differentiator. And so what we'll talk to you about today is what we are doing in partnership that we'll announce today with our solutions, with you, to have machine learning capabilities with something that's core to us, IT ticketing. And how do we find natural language understanding and natural language processing to help change the game 
for that process, which is so voluminous, and some of you know, hasn't changed that much in a long time. So we've done this in a way that no one else has. It's a first that we're really excited about. We talk about bringing disparate systems together. And it's a source of pride for BMC because we have an automation suite of tools that is second to none. And so many retailers and financial institutions and airlines have used our workload automation, our digital business automation, to tie disparate systems together. But it's starting to expand into other parts of the world and other industries. And about four months ago, I spent several hours with a really cool company, and they're called Malware Bytes. And it was interesting because I was starting to see what was happening with security. And I met these folks, and you know, I was dressed like a middle-aged man, and they were very cool in their jeans, and they, you know, dude, and I, I couldn't follow all of it, but <laughs> <laughs> I have to tell you this, they have a bar in their office, so I know I'm out of date, but I did not partake. Yeah, a lot of applause, apparently. Nonetheless, I asked them about their business, as I have a tendency to do, and poke at questions, and I'm very Socratic, and tell me why, and how did it form? And they said, it's really simple, man. We want the whole world to be malware free. I said, that's it? They said, that's it. I said, that sounds like a big undertaking. Oh yeah, we're gonna enable every customer of ours to have zero day threat remediation. I said, I don't know what that means, but it sounds great. So on and on we went, and they talked about how they're using BMC automation. And every day, they are real time scanning millions and millions of endpoints. And they kind of took me through this process. And they're running BMC automation on AWS to manage ingestion, ETL, Hadoop processing. And they're doing this to detect 1.7 trillion data threats every day. They get these threats every day, trillion. And they're watching this on these massive geospatial maps. And they can measure the spread, acceleration, deceleration of these threats. And I said, well, I explain how this all comes together. They said, that's control M, that's you. I said, of course I knew that. That's of course what we do. <laughs> and then they talked about a new solution that we are bringing to market called Workbench to do so so the DevOps community with APIs can speak that same language. And you're gonna see more and more from us on that front and we'll talk about what jobs as code actually means and how we bring it together. And in that business, we're now actually working through managed file transfer to make sure that we're bridging across the ecosystem. So automation has become really, really important and bringing these disparate systems together has been an absolute game changer as customers are in the mode of digital transformation and digital transition. It's also become really important that we understand the needs that customers have related to cost. So as we think about a customer transitioning to a cloud environment, for the most part, there were CIOs who were in the mode of ready, fire, aim, we're doing this. We are doing this. And I commend them, and I understand the mindset, and in many cases, it's for the right reasons. But we've learned from other CIOs that the cost was far in excess of what was anticipated for certain things. And not being able to preempt that cost has caused a tough conversation, which went something like this with one customer I talked to, CFO. Yes, I told you it would be 100 grand for that transition to the cloud. Yes, it was actually a million. Got to go. <laughs> this has happened more than once. And because of that, our teams have worked really hard to develop something called cloud cost control. And we had a great interaction with a very large utility company, an energy company in Europe, in EMEA. And they're spending tens of millions of euros transitioning to cloud. And what they didn't realize was some of those applications that they were moving were more costly than they planned. And so they came back and said, cloud cost control is something we want to use and we want to try. And they're anticipating over three years saving upwards of 11 million euro. 
it, it is an important solution, and I want to make sure we get a chance to talk to you about it. So there's a lot on the docket and a lot the team wants to show. I want to hit one other area because I, I think it's really significant. And it gets back to this idea that as companies transition, the customer is at the forefront. And defining who the customer is is really important. So we call this digital workplace broadly. But we want to make it tangible. And a great example is an automaker called BMW. They have 60,000 employees globally. And they have put in the hands of each of those 60,000 employees our solution on a mobile device, very easy, and they now have IT capabilities in the hands of their workforce. Notably, digital natives who have come into the workforce not eager to make a call to IT, not eager to deal with people that they don't have to talk to, and they've seen an 80% reduction in calls to their service center. It's been phenomenal. And they're doing what they set out to do, sell more BMWs more quickly, globally. So that's a cool story, and it resonates, and we're proud, and they certainly have appreciated that. We also had BMC services on site to make sure we were educating them to teach the teachers and train the trainers to get everybody equipped on those basic functions. But something else has happened that's a real incredible phenomenon, is the customer's customer, the dealers, are now using the same technology in the palm of their hands. And they're doing the same at their service centers. And now those service centers and those dealerships are having that interaction with their customers. And it's become mass proliferation. Another example is a company we talked to yesterday and met with who now has 250,000 of their employees, one of the largest banks in the world, doing the same, on the same journey. And they're seeing similar results. CSAT scores, customer sat going up, IT costs going down. So you can sense excitement from BMC because of what we're doing, but it's not in isolation, and it's not by chance. We are informed by the voice of the customer. We are informed by what we are hearing from you. That is a constant. That should not be a point in time. We encourage you, as much as we're eager to show you today and share with you all that we're doing, and a series of industry firsts we're excited about, to take time to tell us. That makes sense. We're missing that. We need more of this. We look forward to it. I am really, really excited about what's happening in the market and our position in helping you transition. I'm equally as excited to say this is a constant. We are going to continue on this path, and we really look forward to a great session. Thank you so much for being here in New York. Everyone is using the cloud. Business clouds, public clouds, even personal clouds. This makes the management of clouds very challenging and very costly. BMC multi-cloud management solutions offer superior security and compliance, cost control, performance, discovery, and visibility, so you can innovate faster, cost-effectively, and safely on all your clouds. Please welcome President Enterprise Solutions, Bill Baruti. Good morning. How's everybody doing? Glad to be here? All right, well, we're glad you're here. Thank you very much for taking the time to spend with us today. So we've got a packed 70-minute agenda, and I need you to, I need you to put your seatbelts on because we're going to spend the next 70 minutes with 12 co-presenters, six demonstrations, two customers, and two partners. What do you think? There are two key themes that we'll cover in the next 70 minutes, and they're all about your digital transformation journey and the innovation that BMC is delivering to support you in that journey. The first is multi-cloud management. Peter talked about the journey to multi-cloud and the perils and the things that you need to make sure are effective in that transition, and we'll, we'll cover four major innovations in that area. Secondly, we'll talk about the next generation of ITSM and ITOM leveraging artificial intelligence, machine learning, natural language processing, and we'll show you that at work in real live innovation 
in delivered products against use cases that are practical, pragmatic, and deliver real value to your business today. What do you think? Yeah. Sound good? All right, so the first point around this transition to multi-cloud is that it's happening to all of us. Now, I want to see a raise of hands, and I can see a little bit with the lights here, but how many of you today are doing dev and test in a public cloud environment? Okay, maybe a third. How many of you are supporting production applications in a public cloud environment? Okay, a little bit less, but still quite a few. How many of you think you will be in the next three years? Okay, almost everybody, right? So we're all on this journey. We're just at different points in that journey. Now, this journey that we're on requires a new paradigm. It requires some new thinking. Because the way that we've done things in the past, whether it's in a data center or our own private virtualized cloud environment, or quite frankly, I could have the mainframe up here on the screen, is a different world than the hybrid multi-cloud world. In this world where we have complete control and the pace of change is slower, maybe slower than we'd like it to be, and we have technologies and processes that ensure performance, ensure security, ensure compliance, have well thought out ways to manage cost, to manage change and an understanding of where our assets are. That stuff may not work perfectly, but I bet you that all of us feel like we've got it working pretty well. Now when we switch to this new multi-cloud reality, those processes, those technologies don't scale. The same technology that was under our roof, under complete control, doesn't work the same way when we're dealing with public cloud providers, third-party SaaS applications, third parties that are running a private managed cloud operation for us. The processes and the technology that we use there begin to break down. And BMC understands that. And we've been innovating to ensure that our technology will be able to support that new reality with you. And in some cases, we've invented brand new solutions because that's what's required to, to sustain this new reality. So let's get into the innovation. We talked about the fact that on that journey there are a lot of concerns. Performance, cost, security, compliance, new ways of thinking about automation. And we want to demonstrate much of that new innovation for you here live today. So I'd like to invite the demo team to join me on stage. Demo team, can you come on in? <laughs> demo team. There they are. Good thing they were there, because I, I wasn't going to go over there and do all the demos by myself. <laughs> so first, let's start with discovery for multi-cloud. We recently announced that our world-leading discovery technology is now multi-cloud aware. And this is really important. Because first and foremost, if we don't understand the assets as they are on-prem, we won't be able to understand how we're going to run them in the cloud. If we don't understand what relationships need to maintain their interrelationships, we might move something to the cloud and find out that it had five other applications it interacted with to create an end user experience that no longer works. And so we have to be able to baseline things. Then once we live in that new multi-cloud reality and developers are creating new applications and making changes, we have to keep up with the pace of that change. And we have to be able to keep a consistent record of our application footprint across that multi-cloud reality. So this new innovation is a big expansion of our world-class discovery technology. And I'm really excited to ask Vidya to join me on stage to show you a demonstration of this new innovation. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm very excited to share with you guys uh, our latest innovation, as Bill said. Um, so I want to walk through a quick demonstration to highlight our multi-cloud discovery capabilities. Uh, first off, uh, our highlight obviously is our uh, cloud dashboard that we've extended to make sure that we can include a cloud context. So for today, with this multi-cloud discovery capabilities, you can actually have the cloud providers like AWS and Azure to be able to drill down to specific assets, tools, deployments, whatever it might be for a specific cloud provider that have been discovered. 
Then we have also enhanced the visualization capabilities so you as a customer can double click on a specific provider, whether it's AWS or Azure or whatever it might be that you're using to ensure that you can actually look at the specific assets, their dependencies, their relationship mappings, um, and also look at the specific regions through enhanced visualization capabilities. Um, as, as Bill said, we continue to be the leader uh, with the discovery solution. Uh, the, last, the past decade, I think we had, we've had the secret sauce uh, that we call the TKU, or the technology knowledge updates uh, that we do monthly. And we've now extended that capability to cloud discovery. So now you can dynamically discover, uh, add support for new patterns, content, and cloud providers without you having to ever upgrade your discovery service. Uh, as you can see, discovery continues to be, provide you this holistic view of assets and relationship mappings, both on-prem as well as on, uh, on the cloud environments. Uh, we strongly believe that discovery is going to be uh, your trusted single system of record as you navigate through this multi-cloud environment. You don't have to take my word for it. Uh, there is a customer uh, who says, uh, who, who also agrees with us, uh, it's a Computer Center. Um, so this is an example. <laughs> I guess we're seeing the demonstration a little bit later. Right here for you. Um, uh, so here's an example of a Computer Center who is a managed cloud uh, provider out of the UK who works with both uh, public and private uh, companies. Um, and they were part of our multi-cloud discovery beta uh, process, and uh, this, is, this is what they have to say. A quick highlight, I think this kind of ties in what Peter said and what Bill said uh, in terms of uh, visibility and cost and security. Um, so Computer Center had three goals. I like number three. So three goals. Um, number one was really scaling their uh, CMDB. Uh, the second one was really cost savings and cost transparency uh, using uh, asset consolidation, asset efficiency. The third one was really security. So those were their primary goals. And using discovery, they were actually able to um, achieve all of them. So one, they were able to scale uh, their CMDB services to provide updates on a daily basis to over 10,000 assets. Um, and then the second one was uh, really they were able to, um, ahead of time, proactively um, identify uh, a um, major heart bleed, which helped them thwart security breach within their customer organization. So as you can see, Discovery continues to provide the visibility, the cost transparency, as well as the security aspects, especially as you're navigating this multi-cloud environments. With that, I'll pass it on to Bill. Great. Thanks, Vidya. All right, anytime you're trying to coordinate 12 presenters, six demos, et cetera, something happens, and we missed the production shot of the demo there, so apologies. You can see that after the uh, main stage presentation this morning. So let's move on. Next, let's talk about cost. And we're really excited to be announcing, brand new today, here at the event, a new solution, Cloud Cost Control. Now, cost is a big deal. We all know that. And we're all trying to manage cost to the best outcome so that we can innovate more. And the peril of moving to the cloud is the ability to predict what cost will be. How do I understand which applications make sense to move to a public cloud environment where I will actually get cost benefit? versus which applications might I move, and they might cost more without refactoring or completely redeveloping them. And what we don't want are surprises. And so we took a lot of time working with customers, including some here in the room, to determine the right way to help you baseline cost, reflect what cost will be in the future, and then plan for ongoing cost. So I'm very excited to have Shamil join me on stage to give a live demonstration of this new innovation. Hello everyone. Thank you for uh, uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk about cloud cost control. I'd love you uh, love to walk you guys through a few key use cases around the product. First and foremost, the home screen is intentionally designed to be intuitive and giving you full visibility across your entire infrastructure and giving you the cost visibility that you guys are looking for on both on-prem as well as off-prem. 
We leverage our expertise on capacity optimization to bring in the on-prem data into the product, as well as we leverage our forecasting ability to accurately forecast the cost so you're always ahead of, uh, you, you're always aware of what's coming in the future. So uh, together, a lot of our customers love to look at the overall view, but they're really interested in looking at the uh, application-centric uh, uh, application costing, right? So let's go down to the application center. So before we go down to the screen itself, I want to walk you guys through a few ways that you can actually get to the application uh, costing piece itself, right? First and foremost is the BMC discovery product that you guys just saw the demo of. Uh, that's one aspect that you can automatically group things and we can import that uh, application grouping into the product for you to be able to see the costing per application. Second is if you have a third party CMDB, or a CMDB using capacity optimization, you can also uh, import that automatically into it. And lastly, if you're following the tagging guidelines by AWS or Azure, we can automatically import them as well, and we can create application grouping so that you can look at the, the costing individually per application. Let's take one of the examples over here, uh, facility service management. So as soon as you click on the application, uh, this application happens to be running on Azure uh, provider at the moment. Uh, you can immediately identify the daily cost. The, the forecasting algorithm automatically updates on daily basis, so you're always aware of what's coming in the future. At the same time, uh, we break down the cost by individual cost components, which is compute, storage, or whatever the components that, that make up the actual cost. Our vision over here is to be able to uh, allow customers to set budgets for individual applications. So uh, with the machine learning algorithm, we'll automatically be notifying the customer when the application is about to cross the threshold of the budget that they have set. In fact, we're actually double downing on the uh, machine learning aspect and automatically setting baselines for customers to alert them whenever there is an unusual pattern of expense, expense on any of these applications. For instance, if you're using $5,000 last month and you're all of a sudden using about 10,000 this month, the machine learning algorithm will automatically fact that as an, uh, as an unusual uh, expense and would let you know so you can be always proactively managing the budget. So this is a great way to look at a costing per application, but it becomes really interesting. A lot of our customers are, uh, are thinking about migrating their application from one provider to another provider. And they're doing some of these calculations on uh, Excel sheet and, uh, and in general uh, calculation outside of the tool. So we, all we have to do is to click on that simulate cloud migration button and immediately it fits all the resources that you require to migrate an application from Azure in this case to AWS it would automatically fit the resources, at the same time would calculate the pricing for the entire application. A lot of you guys might be wondering, maybe I don't have this application, uh, maybe I don't have this specific need of migrating an instance from a provider to another provider, but you might be resonating more with the journey of migrating your on-prem resource to the public cloud. So let's take that example. We'll go back to the application view and then click an application that is running on-premise. Uh, MSN, for instance. So as soon as you click on it, you get the good stuff, you break down the costing by individual components, uh, you get the daily forecasting as well as the proactive budgeting. But this time around, when you click on the button of simulation, oh, I'm still waiting on the provider, all right. Uh, as soon as you click on the simulate cloud migration button this time around, it actually compares side by side both AWS as well as Azure. With Google Compute also on the roadmap, we can actually start comparing across all of the providers according to the uh, pricing contracts that you have gotten from the actual provider. So if you have a specific contract with AWS or Azure, we automatically import that through the pricing APIs as well as the metadata APIs and the, cost, the pricing that you're looking at are actual pricing for your own environment. Uh, the system automatically finds the right resource to actually fit the environment, so on, on both AWS as well as Azure. But you have an additional option to go ahead and actually right size it, make it more tighter. System would automatically recalculate the pricing for uh, the new settings that you have selected. Also would alert you if you are going to go out of your capacity in order to be able to support that as well. So together with both proactive budgeting as well as uh, being able to simulate cloud migration from one location to uh, on-prem to off-prem as well as multi-cloud uh, multi uh, environments, 
you can totally get in control of your uh, cloud costs at the same time uh, be able to have full visibility on, on your budget as we, as we go forward. I also have an uh, actual track at 345, and I'll be going into more specific use cases uh, in that particular session. And I look forward to working with you guys on uh, saving some of the cloud costs. Thank you. Thanks, Daniel. What do you think? You think that's going to help us make good decisions? Help us avoid that nasty phone call from the CFO? I think so. Well, really exciting. Thank you, Shamil. Well, now what I'd like to do is invite a customer up on stage. We're very lucky to have Elber Benitez. Please join me, Elmer, on stage from In Contact. Thank you. Good morning. We're really glad to have you here and appreciate you taking the time. So, Elmer, first, would you do me a favor and just introduce yourself and your company a little bit? Absolutely. Elmer Benitez, I'm the VP of Cloud Operations for In Contact. Uh, I have the responsibility over our global infrastructure operations and our multi-cloud uh, transformation. Great. And, and for those of you that don't know, InContact provides a call center solution, which is a SaaS-based solution. So Elmer's business yeah. is a service. It is a digital business. So Elmer, we, we've been working together for a while, and you, you've been mm -hmm. a great client partner because you've really helped us think about this multi-cloud journey. We started by working together, helping you optimize cost and performance in your private cloud environment. Can you talk about that a little absolutely, bit? Absolutely, absolutely. So, and uh, let me just add a little bit to the InContact overview. A few of you maybe uh, have not heard about InContact, but as you said, uh, we are a pure cloud uh, contact center as a service. And just about a year ago, we joined forces with uh, Nice Systems. Uh, so we have been able to integrate workforce management, optimization with our omnichannel routing. And uh, over the past 12 years, we have, months, they feel like years sometimes. <laughs> 12 months. Uh, we have been able to come out with, uh, we call CX1, is our next generation integrated platform for all those products on IWS and at the, uh, the cornerstone of all of that, we have uh, a BMC. So our multi-cloud transformation, I think it'll have three main aspects or uh, drivers. One was the application re-architecture and redesign uh, so that we can take full advantage of uh, AWS, which is a, a key partner for us. Uh, the second element was security. Um, most of our customers, or many of our customers, are highly regulated on the financial and healthcare. And uh, again, we also use uh, BMC to, to expand those capabilities. And the third element was uh, uh, cost control. Um, I know that I'm not alone in this situation where, going back to your comment about getting a call from a CFO, I got that one, <laughs> and it was not good. Uh, because it, it's, a, it's, it's a very interesting challenge when, at, at the same time, you want to open innovation for DevOps, and they enjoy creating AWS instances and, uh, and then controlling production. Um, so the, we are very pleased that uh, BMC has added this capability. Now we feel that we have a more end-to-end -end integrated solution that is going to support our vision, our transformation, and at the end, enjoy uh, improve our customer experience. That's great. You know, we've been really fortunate, and many of you in the room have a relationship with BMC like we do with Elmer, where mm -hmm. we were uh, a key part of managing his private cloud environment and that service that they delivered. And, helped with performance and security Absolutely. and cost optimization. But as Elmer, really as a visionary in the industry, began to run more and more of his workloads in AWS, we worked on that together as well, solving performance problems and being able to deliver this new solution based on predictive cost. Yeah, absolutely. So in, in this partnership, uh, we can be able to validate that number one, you, you fully understand the challenges. Uh, this is going to be a, a journey. So uh, our understanding and, uh, of, of the tool, I think that's definitely going to uh, fit not our needs, but um, uh, many enterprises here as well. Great. Elmer, thank you very Absolutely. much. Absolutely. Appreciate you being here. Thank you. Now, let's move on and let's talk about automation. We've automated a lot of the activities that we did in the traditional environment on-prem. And we know that automation is critical. We cannot succeed without automation. And many of you in the room are clients of our world-leading Control M automation solution, digital business automation. But as you move more and more workloads 
to the public cloud, we need to be there with you. As workloads need to run in the cloud, Control M needs to run in the cloud. As workloads move between environments, on-prem, in the public cloud, as you need to move data and application context back and forth, and as you build new applications that are embracing the DevOps process and you want to build automation in from the beginning, we need to make our solutions DevOps ready. So I'm excited to have Ohad join me on stage and talk about the innovation that we're doing in this area as well. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I would like to share with you today, uh, uh, talk to, uh, today about how Control-M works and what Control-M can do for you. I will start with a very simple example that is about a, a billing statement processing. Okay, and, and that will show how Control-M can deliver on multi-cloud application automation. So think about a, a bill, your bill. Think about your phone bill, your utility bill. It's amazing to think how many applications running on different infrastructure and using different data are involved in order to issue this, this, this uh, uh, bill that you're getting by the end of the day. So this is a very common procedure or very common business process, yes, it's very, yet it's very critical. Because if it's not done properly, probably someone will not, will not be paid. And I see that it already started, so let's talk about the demo. <laughs> um, so this, this is Control M. Exactly. So, so this is Control M. Here you can see with a simple drag and drop interface, a, a user can, can build the process, the business process in order to, uh, uh, to, to issue the, and process the bill. It can spend anywhere from mainframe until a multi-cloud environment. No, no expertise are needed. And here, that's the monitoring, okay? That's actually when the, the process itself is running. Here you can get a view from your mobile phone on what's going on. Either is a failure, Control M will notify you about this failure and will let you know, okay, what, 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 what has been running wrong? When is my job is about to complete and when is my entire business process is about to complete? Okay, it also offers you some remediation option like restarting a job or skipping a job in the process. We also offer a, a, a product called Control and Manage File Transfer. Control and Manage File Transfer offer a centric view and dashboarding of all files that are being involved within the business process. Okay, and that can eliminate the costly uh, automation silos that some customers are having out there. On top of that, we offer, with a click of a button, you can uh, provision a control environment from AWS or Azure marketplaces. And also, we're offering Jobs as Code. Jobs as Code, this is a new APIs combined within control and then offer our developers to embed the automation definitions within their code and embed the uh, controlling within their software development lifecycle. Okay, so this was a very quick half demo <laughs> about, about Control M. And now I'm going to transition to talk about one of our customers. This customer, I believe, is a very interesting customer. This is Amadeus. So what are Amadeus doing? Amadeus is a leading provider of technology solutions and services in the travel industry. Okay, so when you look for your destination, your next destination, until actually booking your next trip, Amadeus are handling over 90% of the global travel transactions around the world, connecting between travel uh, buyers, travel sellers, and travel providers. And here are some very incredible numbers. Uh, they're connecting over 700 airlines, 110 airport operators, over 600,000 hotels around the world, hundreds of ferry and cruise and rail and car rental and insurance providers are all handled by Amadeus, okay? And now with, uh, with uh, uh, the travel transactions driven mainly by uh, an online and mobile customers, this uh, industry is exploding, it's just exploding. The rates of transactions are growing double digit, uh, and the current infrastructure of Amadeus just could not uh, uh, support this growth. So what Amadeus are doing, they're actually moving their uh, applications and their infrastructure into their own cloud. It's called Amadeus Cloud Services. That's what they're doing today, and they're of course using Control M to do so. Um, so what are they doing in Control M? They're running today uh, about 300,000 jobs every day with Control M. Thousands of, of those 
are mission critical jobs that are running in parallel. And they're, uh, they're relying on ControlM for their transition to the cloud. Okay, ControlM is, is a core platform they're relying on for this transition together with other technologies such as Kubernetes and OpenShift and, and, the, and the Docker. And what ControlM allows them is to leverage this more flexible and cheaper and faster technology with the ability to seamlessly move their workloads from the old applications to the new applications, from the on-prem infrastructure to the cloud infrastructure. That's a key capability they need in order to succeed with that enormous transition into the cloud. Now, on top of that, they actually restructured themselves, both the operations team and their over 5,000 developers into DevOps team to be more agile and more flexible with, with, uh, with what they're doing. And they're leveraging ControlM uh, automation API and using jobs as code methodologies in order to embed the definitions and the changes, of, uh, the ongoing changes of their automation needs into the uh, software development lifecycle. Um, that allows them, in parallel to the vast amount of transactions they're having, they're running, by the way, 50,000 transactions per second. Okay, 50,000 travel transactions per second. Just to give you an idea, that's about 50% of the Google search overall transactions. So they're doing that constantly, and in parallel, to, uh, uh, thanks to ControlM, they're capable of having about 5,000 IT changes per month, and having over 500 updates in production to their software, to the different applications, with, with an availability of over 99.99% to their systems. Thank you. Thanks, Ohad. Well, thanks very much, Ohad. So, Control M, cloud ready, auto cloud provisioning, and DevOps ready. What do you think? All right, let's move on to our next important subject, which is security, and broadly security and policy compliance. This is a big risk area. And you know, we've got an interesting quote here from Gartner, and if you read the report, what they're really talking about is the point that we made earlier, which is that the same ways that we managed security protection, compliance policy management on the on-prem environment is very different when we move to the cloud. And if we just assume that everything is safe and secure, we're going to get bitten. So we have to rethink the way that we approach security and compliance in a multi-cloud world. Well, BMC agrees with that, and we're excited today to announce a brand new service, SecOps Policy Service from BMC. This is a native cloud-delivered solution which addresses your ability to protect yourself against vulnerabilities, prioritize them and auto-remediate them, to ensure that your policies, whether they're industry, internal, government regulatory, can be applied to a multi-cloud environment, and then you can do continuous checks to ensure adherence to compliance, to ensure security, and to auto-remediate when something isn't compliant. So with that, I'm really excited to invite Daniel to join me on stage to demonstrate this new innovation. First, I want to give a shout out to JT on the demo stand. JT is the core behind everything we do. So if it goes wrong, it's JT's fault. <laughs> uh, so I want to, want to call back to what Bill just said. 95% of the breaches that we're going to have in our public cloud, uh, violations, vulnerabilities, data loss, is going to be somebody's fault. It's the customer's fault. And what that means is somebody put a configuration in there that wasn't supposed to be there. They were a little lax on what they were supposed to do, which is totally understandable. Because when you think about the public cloud, it's not just my particular application. It's my particular application running on perhaps dozens of different services in lots of different instances across multiple regions. right? And all of those are configured and have to be configured exactly correctly in order to be safe. So I'll give you an example of, of one of those vulnerabilities, one of those breaches, and we're going to walk through it today. Uh, are you guys familiar with Elasticsearch? 
Yeah, so very, very heavily used service. Uh, AWS runs it as a managed service within AWS. And for those of you that aren't familiar, Elasticsearch is a really powerful way to aggregate your data and have it be queryable, either in a structured or unstructured way. And it's really fast, it's really easy, uh, and so people use it a lot, but it's also really easy to get wrong. So the, the example we're gonna walk through today is a vulnerability in Elasticsearch running in AWS. And this came out in January of this year. And so it was January 13th. It uh, just happened to be a Friday. And I know, and by the way, tomorrow is... Yeah. Right. Friday the 13th. <laughs> so it's, what, what happens is, is that there's a little configuration in AWS Elasticsearch, which if you're not doing it correctly, lets anybody come in look at your data, and that's bad, right? Download your data, well that's really bad, and then go delete your data from where you had it. And so a ransomware attack started immediately around this. And so the story we're gonna tell right now and the demo we're gonna walk through is, pretend that you're a security engineer, it's Friday the 13th, you're on top of things, so you say, well, I, I need to go make sure that I'm safe. So luckily enough, you're a policy service customer, Forget the fact that policy service didn't exist January 13th of last year, but pretend. And you want to first log in and you want to ask a simple question. Do I even use this service? And while that is a simple question, it's often a very hard question for our customers to answer because our app dev teams are using services and be able to make their own choices about their technology all the time. And so I want to see, you know, am I exposed here? Do I even use this service? So the first thing I'll do is I'll go up here to resource types and I'll select the ES domain, oh, we've already done it. And then we find that we do have Elasticsearch domains. And in fact, we have nine of them. And we've applied a, a BMC policy to Elasticsearch. So we wrote a policy specifically for Elasticsearch to make sure it conforms with the security and compliance regulations and best practices. We see six of those resources are fully compliant, but three of them aren't. And so the next step, obviously, is we want to drill down onto those three and see what they are. Maybe there's something critical that we need to take care of. Well, if we look at that last one, that one seems pretty important, my customer data. So maybe we need to go take a look at that real quick and see what exactly part of the policy is, is being violated here. So when we drill down into that, we see that, yeah, this is, this is, this is one. And this is going to be vulnerable to this because it's violating the open access policy. So what we did, and we did it really quickly, is we understood from all of our different resources, which are the ones that were most critical and were vulnerable to this particular exploit. We identified the one that we want to remediate quickly and fast with the My Customer Data one. But now we also need to see uh, how we go about doing that. So in order to remediate this, all we have to do is click there, and then we go hit the remediate button. And what this is going to do, it's going to go out to AWS, it's going to look at that configuration, and it's going to change it for that resource. But not just in one particular instance, it's going to change it across all the instances that that resource actually exists, which is pretty powerful. Now, the interesting thing about this is, I mean, the, the interface looks great and, and all those things, but everything that we showed you today is driven by REST APIs. So everything that we show you today, you can integrate programmatically into your services, into your process, into your controls. As an outgrowth of that, we also have enabled it through DevOps pipelines. So if you have a CI CD process and you want to do policy checks all along the way as soon as things are being created, as soon as they go into dev, as soon as they go into test, you can apply these policies and do these auto remediations. Which means that if you were a customer of policy service, you are never gonna have this vulnerability in front of you at all. So if that's interesting to you, please find me. I'll be, be in, the, in the, the, uh, the adjoining room. Go find JT. He's gonna be giving a, a deep dive about this. Uh, I, what, what time is your, your deep dive? One? Okay. And go, go find us and ask some more questions. You can get started really easily and really quickly on this, from soup to nuts, to, to, to log in, to finding your data and being able to see what it is. It takes about 10 minutes. So please uh, enjoy the rest of the show. 
Um, it's a pleasure to talk to you guys, and uh, we're happy to talk to you more about policy service. Great. Thanks, Daniel. Thanks, JT. So security, compliance, multi-cloud management, DevOps ready. You think you're going to sleep better at night with a solution like that in the multi-cloud world? Yeah. Yeah, me too. <laughs> okay, now we're going to transition from the multi-cloud management discussion into next generation ITOM and ITSM. And we believe that the future of these markets is going to be determined by our ability to use the massive amounts of data available to us to automate more and to make people more efficient. Now, as was said earlier today, there's a lot of talk about AI and ML and natural language processing, and that's all good, but until we make it practical, until we apply it to a use case that we can implement in our environment, it's really just a lot of hype. So we thought a lot about this, and by the way, with a lot of feedback from you. And we're gonna start with a demonstration of three personas. First, the end user. By the way, how many of us get excited when we have to call the call center? Okay, I don't see a single hand, right? So users don't wanna have to do that. We need to provide better ways to give users to interact with IT, to interact with digital services, and we'll talk about that. Secondly, the agent. How many of you have budgets for your call center personnel that are rising as fast as the explosion of digital services that you're delivering? Anybody? No, nobody. So the reality is we need to enable our agents to up-level the quality of work they're doing. We need to take away the mundane and allow those things to be done with the help of machines and machine learning. And we need to elevate the agents to work on the hardest problems that really only humans can tackle. And then lastly, we need to make these capabilities available to developers because we want to bake in this kind of technology, this kind of enabling capability right into our applications. And by the way, we want to do it with all forms. We want to do it with IBM. We want to do it with Microsoft. We want to do it with AWS. We want to do it with BMC's own machine learning technology. But we need to be open in the way that we allow that to happen so that whatever your choice for the best cognitive AI, ML technology is, we embrace it and make it easy for you to use in the context of our solutions. So I'm very excited to have Naoki join me on stage today to demonstrate this new innovation. Thank you, Bill. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Good morning. So like Bill said, service management as a category, be it uh, IT service management, or customer service management is going through a major disruption. Disruptions with technologies like AI and all, chatbots, bots that are not just intelligent, but they're conversational. They can have a conversation like you and I can have a conversation. And also virtual agents and virtual assistants that are now evolving from the consumer world into the enterprise world. So there are three main things that we want to show you today. Really, really cool demos. I welcome Terence, who's going to do all the demos for us here. The first one is the end user experience. What does the end user experience look like as they evolve their interaction from the traditional channels of using a phone or email or having to fill up a big form for requesting a service to what that interaction would look like when they would interact with a chat bot or a bot. Bot not just in one channel, but across multiple channels. So here is our digital workplace. You heard Peter talk about it. All of our customers use digital workplace as one stop shop for providing all services, be it IT services, HR services, procurement services, in fact, one of the largest financial institutions that Peter talked about, rolled this out to over 250,000 employees globally, worldwide. Now, we are happy to announce the integration of digital workplace with Slack. How many of you know Slack? Awesome. Slack is very popular and common among younger generation. My son, who is 16 years old, uses Slack all the time, 
and uses it for all of his projects. So now you can use Slack as a way to create any service request. So Bill just gave me a promotion. Bill, that's a cue. Congratulations. <laughs> and I'm moving my office. So for me to put my office request in, I can put that request in, in Slack without going anywhere else. So as I'm putting my request in, you can see that the Slack bot is having a conversation with me. It's trying to understand where my current location is, which floor I'm moving to, which office I'm moving to, and is able to fulfill that entire request without me leaving Slack as a channel. Slack, which is one of the common channels among younger generation, becomes the preference and the choice. And if you extend this a little further, SMS. How many of you SMS, the text messaging? I better see every hand raised there. Good. One of my favorites, I'm very comfortable in it. I use it all the time. We just moved from Texas to California, and I realized I forgot to update my home address. So we'll use SMS, the SMS bot, to update the home address. In fact, Terrence is going to use Siri to actually ask the SMS to fulfill that request. Go ahead, Terrence. I'd like to update my address. So as you can see, it's having a conversation. As we put the address in, it confirms that the address is correct and fulfills that request without me leaving SMS as a channel, a channel that we are all very comfortable in and using day in, day out. Let's take it a little further. Virtual agents, how would that interaction look like when you're interacting with the virtual agent? There's a virtual agent sitting right next to Terence on that table. And by the way, Terence just got married and he's very progressive. <laughs> and he's very progressive and he's taking on his wife's last name. <laughs> he's going to ask that virtual agent to update his last name to his wife's last name. Go ahead, Terence. Alexa, update my last name. <laughs> Give it two minutes. <laughs> it's processing through remedy. I'm kidding. Why would you like to change? I got married. What is your new name? Smith. Smith, we have created a case to update your last name. Your case number is case o o o o That that is woo, that is a remedy. By the way, all of these demos are live demos. Every one of them. <laughs> the Slack demo. There is no, there is no recording. I mean, there is live demos. The Slack demo, the SMS demo, the Alexa demo. Every one of them are a live recording. So live, live demo. So the point is, the channel that the user is comfortable, the end user is comfortable, whether it is Slack as a channel, SMS as a channel, or a virtual agent as a channel, is what we want to provide them so that they can interact in the channel of their preference, and that's what we call omni-channel experience, providing that omni-channel experience to those end users. So you will ask, Nayaki, great, looks good. Well, what are we doing in Remedy? What are the key innovations, especially what deep learning capabilities are we embedding in Remedy? And as we were talking to all our customers to understand the various use cases where the power of deep learning will really help, one thing that we heard loud and clear is as you have massive volumes of tickets coming in, hundreds and thousands of tickets coming in on a daily basis, classifying every ticket into the right category, assigning that ticket to the right individual, and making sure that ticket goes through the right workflow is a very manual and a labor-intensive process. So what we did is we implemented deep learning capabilities for these three big processes that are very intensive and very expensive, and all of you are spending umpteen number of hours trying to manage this. 
the big difference between how we were doing in the past to how we are doing now, before we did have auto classification, but we used rule-based classification, which was very uh, constrained and had its own limitations. Now, we are using deep learning capabilities using NLP and use the data, historical data and the current data to really classify it accurately. So here is an example of an agent workspace. We're just showing you this workspace so we can demo you. Most of the customers who are used to Remedy would probably know the smart recorder, which is a very slick user experience. Right here as uh, Terence was entering the ticket, you see that even though he misspelled it, the system was automatically able to recognize the right category and assign the right category to that ticket. And if by mistake, or if you enter something that doesn't make any sense, like a banana, it errors out. Now you can all predict what is that AI platform, the deep learning platform that we are leveraging. You will come to it in a little bit on what the details are. So let's extend into future, a little bit into future, as we evolve from IT to non-IT assets and how the experience of a facilities manager would look like as he's managing his facilities through a chatbot. So here is an example of an office space. As we drill down in the office space, you can see every floor in that space, every conference room in that uh, floor, and all the various non-IT assets, like a projector, like a, a telephone, or an AC unit. And right from there, this is our next generation CMDB that we are working on, and right from there, you can drill down and see what the status of those assets are. And you put the experience of a facilities manager who is responsible for managing all of these assets through a chatbot. Right from his chatbot, he can ask, hey, give me the health of all the assets I have in my facility. And response back, and also highlights if there's an asset that's not working, and right from there, you should be able to turn it on or off. By the way, this use case is a little futuristic. We are not there yet. But the first two, we are in production, it's available. All of this running on our innovation suite platform, consuming the microservices, the microservices for cognitive auto classification, auto assignment, auto routing, that's available right now. And it's all of it is powered by IBM Watson. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm happy to announce our partnership with IBM and we have Beth Smith, the general manager of IBM Watson Technology here, joining us here on the stage. Good morning. Good morning. I'm so excited about this. And I have to tell you, you know, Peter's points that he was talking about earlier about the use case just resonate with me so much. I'm, I'm practical. Many of you I've probably met in my mainframe days and, and some other system things. And I think what these guys are doing is just fantastic with how to bring to life this core technology. So Beth, can you talk about, we just started working like no more than two and a half months, right? right? Since the first conversation to actually being able to announce this partnership on the stage here in front of everyone with the live use cases. So how do you see this partnership? How does IBM see this partnership on what those use cases could look like in future too? Yeah, so I, you know, I think it is fundamental, like I said a minute ago, to really be grounded in use cases and use cases that matter to what people do every day. Terrific examples here with how chatbots understand natural language, how they understand natural language processing, how deep learning is used for that, how it understands the domains that you're dealing with here, the kinds of things that are a part of your business to enable that self-service piece, and then to extend into you know, ticket classification and that sort of thing. But, but that's sort of the beginning. We go from there into how do you unlock and discovery, not just discovery your resources everywhere, like BMC is doing quite well here with multi-cloud, but how do you discover things that are in your data, in your documents? concepts, connections, things that you didn't know existed. How do you better understand contracts, statements of work, regulations? It's going through all of that. And so I would just, I would just end those comments 
with a little bit of a challenge. I would tell you, I believe all professionals, all of us, are gonna be using AI in ways to help competitive advantage on those use cases. And I would take a little bit from a recent HBR study that said managers will not all be replaced by AI, but the managers that use AI will replace most of the ones that don't. And I think that is gonna to apply to more than managers. So anyway, I'm really excited about what we have here. So with that, this is just the beginning and we have a long way to go. So Beth, thanks a bunch. Really look Thank forward you. to the partnership. Thank you all. Thanks a bunch. Great. Beth, thank you very thank you. much. Mayaki, thank you, great job. What do you think? You think we can drive higher levels of service and some cost efficiency with practical use cases of AI like this? Yes. You think? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, this isn't pipe dreams, this is real. Now, I mentioned, oops, we've skipped forward there. I mentioned uh, that BMC has been developing our own machine learning platform. And we have a solution called TrueSight Intelligence. And I wanna add a new persona to the slide here, the service manager. So what the service manager has to understand is where are the greatest volume of activities, of tickets, of problems that I could automate, that I could apply machine learning to? And understanding that is a difficult challenge because the volumes of data, the volumes of tickets, the volumes of problems that come at a service manager are so big, it's impossible for the human brain to sort them in ways that makes them actionable. So I'm really excited to have Jer Darren join me on stage to demonstrate our new solution, TrueSight Intelligence. Great, thanks Bill. All right, good morning everyone. So as Bill introduced and, as, and Beth and Nayaki talked about, um, there's really two levers that you can pull as we're all managing incidents or events or, or, or what we're managing at our service desk. You can get faster, right? You can pull this lever and get faster and more efficient. Nayak and Beth talked about things that we're absolutely doing today to make you more efficient and ideally increase that user experience, improve the user experience. But pull the other lever, which is prevent the incidents from happening in the first place. Get to this thing that many of us have talked about for years, which is proactive problem management, right? But that's very difficult to do, as Bill just said, because of the volume of tickets, because of where tickets are coming from, not just user generated or, or bot generated, but machine generated through your events, et cetera. We don't have the time to do it and we haven't had the ability to do it. It really comes down to visibility, understanding what's underneath our tickets. So let's take a quick look at a demonstration. I've got my lovely assistant, Seth, over here. Um, <laughs> What we have here is actually Scott Crowder's BMC remedy tickets loaded into TrueSight Intelligence, our SaaS-based analytics platform built on big data technology like Cassandra, Spark, um, evidently a very vulnerable elastic, so Seth, I hope we're on that one. But we have 2.3 million tickets shown in the categories that we normally use at our service desk, tier one, tier two, tier three. There's not a lot of information that's shown just from categorization, right? First, we see that 45% of our tickets at category one level are infrastructure services. So Seth, let's, let's dig into this a little bit and see what else we see. Not a lot more information, frankly, if we just look at categories, but I'm interested in the application servers over here. We've got 17% of them, 150, 180,000 tickets over here. But again, if we're talking application servers, all I know is that they're Intel and Unix based. I can't go have a conversation from the service desk or IT operations with the application teams just based on what OS they're running. That doesn't really help me. Let's, let's wipe this out. Let's go to the other one that I noticed, which is interesting. Other, other, that's, that's not very helpful. Wow, that's really not helpful. Who has other ticket category at their <laughs> service desk? Everybody has other tickets. I've talked to customers that have upwards of 50% of their tickets being classified as other. And even if you're automating the process of interacting with your service desk, many of those tickets aren't gonna fall into a category, so it's gonna be other, right? So what am I gonna do? Am I gonna read through 240,000 tickets? Am I gonna manually read through those? Are you gonna read? Hell no. We're not gonna read through 240,000 tickets, right? So wipe this out. Let's talk about what TrueSight Intelligence, one of the elements of the TrueSight AI Ops platform that we are using to help you with this problem. We're gonna read them all for you, basically, okay? We're gonna apply natural language processing and machine learning algorithms against your tickets to better classify them. The first thing you see is 
we've organized it into 50 simple clusters. It took about 15 minutes to read about 100,000 tickets, actually 100,687 100, tickets. It took about 15 minutes to read those. That's probably faster than you could read those, right? <laughs> I'll bet. So first of all, you see that you don't have this big category of 50 infrastructure, 50%, 47% of infrastructure tickets. And we see that we immediately start to get better information to dig into our tickets based on what they're actually associated with. And some tickets, rather than just being categorized, they can be associated with multiple problems. So Seth, let's look at, um, let's look at the email address down here. I, I have personally had a lot of problems with email addresses for whatever reason. What's interesting here is that rather than just it being an exchange problem or an NT problem, we've got malware issues. Let's then go have a conversation based on this information with the security team rather than just the email team to understand how our devices are being configured or how email is being set up or maybe there's actually a problem from a security perspective long term. So this is just a quick demonstration to, under to help you understand that from the perspective of increasing efficiency with your teams as well as being more agile to dig into and understand what's really happening with all of your tickets, we'll do the reading for you. You don't have to do that. And we'll help you then begin your process to remediate and improve the processes that are underlying all of your incidents and the most prevalent incidents. Because we've actually seen that 25 to 50 percent of tickets are being generated by repetitive activities, things that you know are going to happen, but you just haven't had time to do that. So let's tackle that together, OK? All right, Seth, thank you very much. I think we're all set. OK, now. Thanks to all the demo teams. Um, I think we're done with demos for now. What I'm going to do now is actually transition the conversation a little bit, just for a few minutes. We've talked about how AI and ML can improve IT operations, improve the ITSM conversation. But let's talk about how it actually transforms the business, because that's actually why we're doing it, right? We need to, in our IT operation space, be a better builder of value for our business in a more proactive fashion. So I'm going to bring Chris Adams up. He's, our, he's the President and Chief Operating Officer of Park Place Technologies. All right, Chris. Okay. Great. So Chris, thanks for joining us. Sure. We've actually met a few months ago. He's uh, from one of, one of my hometowns. I guess I have a few of <laughs> Cleveland, Ohio. Um, Chris, let's just start by, you tell us a little bit about Park Place. Sure, uh, Park Place is a global provider of post-warranty data center maintenance. Uh, we've got 10,000 customers, 30 some thousand data center locations, probably three, 400,000 servers, at least 40,000 storage arrays. Uh, we're over 100 countries globally. So, you know, the stuff you saw up here, uh, we probably have the most diverse, data, most diverse data center, if you think about it that way, uh, of any customer here, and probably generate more unique tickets. We have more unique hardware. Uh, I think the other day I saw we just added Deck Alpha, as an example. I don't even think they've made that for 20 years. So uh, we, our customers uh, range from SMB all the way up to enterprise Great. Fortune 500. Great. You've been on an interesting transformation. You've done six acquisitions, I think, in the last yeah. year or two. Um, you're not a technologist. You're actually a finance and accounting guy by trade, right? That's where I started. So tell me what AI and ML and just the use of data, tell me what that means to this transformation that you're doing. Well, you know, our, our business model historically has been reactive. You know, our customers call us upset at 3 in the morning because their stuff's not working. And our job's to get it up and working quickly. So in our world, historically, it's taken eight interactions before that incident gets mm -hmm. resolved. That's a lot of back and forth on the phone, a lot of triage work. And we started thinking to ourselves, how do, how do we solve this? You know, this is just not a good customer experience. Uh, it's not very efficient. So how do we innovate our industry? And we initiated a process two years ago where we looked at nine providers to find somebody who could, across all those platforms in a data center, so not specific to any one manufacturer, but we've got uh, probably close to 100 manufacturers. Mm -hmm. We needed to find one solution provider. Uh, we put BMC through the ringer. We, we uh, yes, did. kicked it down the steps. <laughs> we beat it with a stick, true sight. Uh, so if anybody wants a reference on it, I'm a good one, because I don't think anybody's more diverse. And at the end of the day, uh, yeah, deserves a round of applause. At the end of the day, 
uh, TrueSight was the product that was standing at the end, and we're very proud to have partnered with uh, BMC because for us, this isn't, this isn't cost reduction. This is actually revenue generating. You know, we want to build a platform that we can take to our customers. Yeah. Uh, so the key, though, is the, the reactive uh, service experience for the yeah. customer. We want to move to proactive. So in our world, we want to call the customer before they know they have something down. Uh, and that was really the objective of, of us moving forward with TrueSight. Right, right. Okay, great. Well, I think we're out of time, but Chris, thanks sure. for joining us. Thanks. We have Chris, thanks very much. one more comment real quick. We have track sessions where we'll be demonstrating more of this around TrueSight Intelligence and the rest of TrueSight. And Bill and, and everyone else, we'd love to see you down there in the track sessions later. So, awesome. Bill, thanks Darren, for your time. Darren, thank you. Thank you, Chris. So we've thrown a lot of technology at you today, and that's exciting. BMC's innovating at a rate and pace like never before, and we're innovating to be where you want us to be as you move forward with multi-cloud, as you move forward with the utilization of AI, ML, NLP, et cetera. But you know, technology's not enough. If all we do is drop off technology at your doorstep or give you a SaaS-delivered solution, but you don't know how to use it and you don't know how to make decisions around how to embrace these technologies and the change that you're trying to drive in your business, then we're not a complete partner. And BMC has always provided services around our technology, but we're advancing those services. We're advancing so that we can be your partner in making decisions about what should move to a multi-cloud environment, what should move to a public cloud environment. As you do so, what assets need to be considered in terms of their continued connectedness to allow you to be successful as you move into a multi-cloud reality? In addition to that, we also have new services available to help you move the BMC products into a public cloud or managed service environment. Because we know that many of you would prefer someone else manage those resources or that they run in a public cloud. And so we have services to help you aggressively migrate our own technology to a multi-cloud reality as well. And we're excited to announce that here today at the event. Now, providing technology that supports your journey to multi-cloud is one thing. Providing services to help you do that is another. But we also need to be embracing the public cloud providers that you're transitioning to in a big way. We need to be there with them for you. And so with that, I'm very excited to welcome Bina on stage from Amazon Web Services. Bina, thanks for uh, joining us here at the event today. And, and Bina will be with us all day and can spend more time with you. But if you didn't see the news this morning, BMC announced an exciting strategic partnership with AWS to ensure that we are there with you together in helping you manage in a multi-cloud reality. It's so Bina, sense. let me give you a chance just to introduce yourself to the crowd a little bit. Sure. So I'm Bina Kimani. I'm global head for the infrastructure segments as a partner ecosystem in AWS. And as a part of that, we, I have storage, security, networking, uh, high performance computing, DevOps, et cetera, segments. And very, very excited to be here and meet quite a few of our valued customers and partners here. So thank you, Elmer. By the way, all of you must have seen the beautiful demos that Nayaki and Shyamal and team put together. So Shyamal, I want to specifically call out, thank you for showcasing that the AWS is a lot more cost effective than many other people. <laughs> that wasn't lost on Vina. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. So Vina, uh, yeah. you, you work with uh, a lot of your customers yes. and you work with a lot of our joint customers. What, what are some of the challenges that you see your clients and our joint clients facing as they migrate to a multi-cloud world? Absolutely. So migration is a journey, and uh, you know many of you are embracing it. It's a, there are many phases of the journey, at different phases of the journey, whether you are discovering the workload, whether it is workload mobility phase, whether it is monitoring and the user acceptance and the application service level acceptance after the workload, there are different challenges we run into. And it, it requires many you know, significant commitment from different parts of the business. 
So organizational changes that it requires, the business process adjustment it requires, the tooling that you need, and the partners you need, like BMC, that can make you successful along the way. Those are some of the critical factors that can really make, it, make or break it. And it's very, very important to have those right things in place and the right partnerships in place that can handhold you throughout this journey. And I can tell you it's been a fantastic experience for BMC. AWS has allowed us to learn a lot in working together to make sure that we optimize our technology to deliver against the challenges that we've been talking about all day in the AWS environment. So thank you to that. And as you can see from the slide behind me, our solutions are all well positioned to address multi-cloud, in particular, the AWS environment against these challenges. Now, Bina, talk a little bit about what, why is BMC special? I mean, we, we announced a strategic relationship today. You have relationships with thousands of ISVs. Why is BMC a little bit different and unique? So BMC has a really strong suite of you know, products and services that can cover many phases of the workload migration and you know, whether you are discovering your, you know, initially you are trying to figure out. It's, cloud journey is not if you are going to move to cloud or not, it is about when you are going to move to cloud. And when you are going through this journey, you know, initial things that you run into is that I got this, I don't know, 2,000 applications and services. Which one are the ones that I'm going to pick and prioritize as a you know, first priority in my first phase, phase of this journey? So BMC Discovery Tool can help you there. As you are going through this journey and you are figuring out that you know, cloud is secure, you know, Gartner and quite a few other analysts have called out that cloud security is not the worry that you should be worried about. It's about you know, are your applications going to be secure? Now, as you know, AWS provides tons of tools and services and partnerships like BMC that can help you make sure that your applications and services are secure as you're moving to cloud. You're going through this journey and at the end of the you know, migration, you're trying to figure out that is my service level you know, before the migration and after the migration, is it same, is it better, is it worse? How is that doing? So you are, again, you got BMC disc, you know, monitoring tools then, that can help you figure that out. And not only at the end, but at the, you know, in baselining your applications throughout the journey, it can help you. As you are doing this cloud migration, cost is in our, everybody's mind. So we saw a beautiful demo on the cost optimization while you are you know, working with different phases of this. And, not only throughout the journey, but as you continue to use your applications, your services, and you are trying to make sure that throughout your services don't go out of the roof and you can control it. So BMC has a suite of applications and services that can fill gap in many of these areas that you need. Not only that, BMC has very, very strong enterprise customer base and the relationships with enterprise clients that can you know, uh, help our, us really, really accelerate your journey to AWS Cloud, and we can really make it easy for you. So very well, happy, thank you, happy and, and excited I, I, about I this remember back. I remember back sure. to the meeting that we had two, three months ago in Seattle when we really put our heads down and said we're going to go mm -hmm. after this. And the example that Bina and other senior leaders in AWS gave was that in a typical enterprise transition, they might have to engage as many as 50 different ISVs to make the journey to Amazon and make the journey to multi-cloud reality. And BMC's working hard to make that easy for us to be your partner on the multi-cloud journey. And that's what we're spending our time together working on. Bina, Thanks, thank you very, very much. Very happy to be here. Thank you. And by the way, in case you missed it on the slide here, we're also excited to announce that many of BMC's core technology is available today to run in AWS, to run on AWS, and many, many, many more to come. Well, I hope uh, we didn't move too fast. I know we did a lot, six demonstrations, 12 speakers, two customers, two partners. I hope it was, uh, was exciting for you. I know we're excited. We, we really, we reviewed two, again, fundamental areas. Four new innovations, that are set up to help you succeed in a multi-cloud transformation, two innovations around the journey to make ITOM and ITSM more efficient and to deliver better experiences leveraging AI, leveraging ML to our end users. And then we saw modern user experiences, intuitive user experiences, which of course all of our consumers demand. 
We also talked about open standards-based APIs that allow you to integrate all of this new innovation with the rest of the technology that you depend on every day. And to apply those APIs to integrate these solutions into your modern DevOps processes so that you can build operations into the DevOps process. And then finally, we saw all of this technology supporting your journey to a multi-cloud reality. So what do you think? Well, I wanna, I wanna thank you for your time and I wanna thank all of my co-presenters. And uh, what we'll do now is we're gonna take a 10 minute break and we ask you to be efficient and come back in 10 minutes because our next activity is a really exciting customer panel. Thank you very much.
see what my next slide is. <laughs> Please welcome back to the stage, Dan Streetman. All right. Good morning, New York. It's still morning. Let's keep it up. All right. I hope you heard from our, our voice and our announcer outside. We're going to make a slight shift to our agenda. And so it's my distinct pleasure and honor to get to welcome Mr. Tim O'Reilly. Tim O'Reilly is a CEO and founder of O'Reilly Media. They publish books, he runs tech conferences, but more importantly, Tim has been a tech visionary about all things digital for a long time. He's one of the most influential voices in the technology industry today. He has actually, first book that I read was published in 1992, and it was called The Whole Internet, and it was only about that thick. <laughs> so you can imagine how thick that book would be today. Tim has also founded, essentially really established the Open Source Coalition. He founded terms like Web 2.0, and he's done a lot of research and vision and basically visioneering around what digital means to us, what AI means to us. He's really the champion of alpha geeks everywhere. And he's going to share some of his thoughts about AI, the future of work, and why it's up to us. I'm really happy to have him here today because we're just actually one day after launching Tim's new book, WTF. Right? We know what that might mean, right? But instead it means this. What's the future and why it's up to us? Uh, really exciting content, really exciting speaker. It's my distinct pleasure. Please help me with a warm welcome for Mr. Tim O'Reilly. I'm here to give you a little bit of big picture thinking. And I want to start with this phrase. WTF, because of course it doesn't mean what's the future. <laughs> but we use that expression a lot when we think about the future. I mean, when I left on this trip, you know, I spoke to a $200 device in my kitchen, and actually it was a $100 device, and asked it to call me a car. Car showed up, took me to the airport. Yeah, how crazy is that? You know, even a few years ago, people seeing that would say, WTF, <laughs> well, which is an expression, of course, that means, what's the future? Because they, would, they were not living in that future. You know? But, you know, a lot of people also look at the future and they're worried about it. So uh, this is a, a thing that's been concerning me. They, they look at the influence of technology and they hear a lot about technology is going to take away jobs. Technology is going to make the world worse. And they say WTF in a very different tone of voice. So I wanted to write a book about what the great technology platforms that I've engaged with through my 35-year you know, career in the technology industry really have to teach us about the future of business and the economy. And I basically spent a lot of time thinking about how to think about the future and how to think about the impact of technology. And I'm going to really start there. The first lesson that we see from technology, and actually from history, really, is that our maps of the world can steer us wrong. Now, here's a map of North America from 1625. Now, I don't know if you can see it uh, clearly enough, but California is presented as an island. Now, of course, many people in America still think of it that way. <laughs> but. Uh, when you hear that there was once a missionary expedition that dragged boats across the Mojave Desert in order to cross the ocean that they expected to find on the other side to reach the mainland, uh, you realize that if you have the wrong map, you can really get into a lot of trouble. And this happens all the time in business. I think uh, one of the things that uh, you know, kind of made me famous as a futurist and not just as a, a, a conference producer and, and a technology book publisher was the work that I did in 1998 around reframing the concept of free software. Because in 1998, they thought that free software was the enemy of commercial software. You know, it was a story, big narrative. And what I noticed was that all of the really interesting narrative about Linux 
uh, was focused on the fight with Microsoft. And they left out the fact that the internet was also based on free software. And I was saying, why aren't they talking about that? So I want to ask you, how many of you here in the audience use Linux? Well, you know, actually all of you use Linux. I started asking that question back in, uh, you know, 2002, 2003 or so. It was, a, it was a way to get people to think about the way the world was changing to this, what we now call the cloud. That, of course, Google was running on Linux. Amazon was running on Linux. All these internet services were running on Linux. And what you use no longer meant what you use on the desktop, what you use in your everyday device. So understanding that we were moving to this multi-device world caught a lot of people uh, by surprise. And I was able to identify, uh, just by looking at the present and trying to build a better map, that it wasn't really about the battle between proprietary software and free software, but that it was that the internet was commoditizing a lot of things that had been previously been valuable, and something new, in particular big data and collective intelligence, was going to become valuable on the basis of new business empires. So, uh, you know, the other thing I noticed uh, well, very early on was this idea that we now call DevOps, that in these uh, you know, internet applications, the developers were still inside them. You know, the applications were no longer artifacts, they were business processes, you know, new kind of partnership between people and machines, right? So, and I, you know, this came to a head around uh, uh, the dot-com bust, and I told a story about what I call Web 2.0, namely the, the, the companies that survived it and what they understood that other companies didn't. So, this is an example of what I call framing blindness. People framed the world in terms of the PC paradigm. They couldn't see what the internet meant yet. So, why am I telling you this ancient history? Right? Because it's still happening. This was the connected taxi cab just a year or so before we had Uber and Lyft. You know, we, we, we knew what you would do with a connected taxi cab. You put a screen in the back and you ran ads. Right? And all the while, these capabilities were there of connecting passengers in real time. You know, the, the future was actually right there in our face, and we hadn't realized yet what it meant. And then suddenly, and it's interesting, because the innovations don't usually come in one great feat of inspiration uh, from one you know, inventor. It's very interesting to look at the history of Uber and Lyft. And it turns out there was an innovator named Sunil Paul who actually wrote some patents for connecting passengers in real time, actually back in 2000. Uh, but it was too early. There weren't enough smartphones. He abandoned the business. He didn't actually, he never raised any money. And then in 2008, when Travis Kalanick and Garrett Camp came up with the idea for Uber, they were just talking about summoning black cars. And they were doing it with text messaging. And bit by bit, that evolved. But Sunil came back on the scene, and he launched uh, a, a company uh, called Sidecar, uh, which had the idea of having ordinary people do their cars. So Uber invented that magical user experience of the smartphone or the phone connecting and summoning the car. Sunil brought in this idea of, of uh, uh, you know, ordinary people doing their cars. Lyft, which had been basically using ordinary people for a previous service, which was for long distance commuting, jumped on Sunil's idea, launched Lyft, uh, which was really the first uh, true you know, connected uh, car application as we know it today. Uh, Uber didn't actually pick up the idea of, of using ordinary people for another year after that till 2012. So you, you kind of see technology takes a while for people to get out of these framing blindness modes. And similar story, the Amazon Echo. You know, we actually had devices that were listening, uh, able to interpret our speech. You know, Siri came out in 2011. Why, why did it take three years before we had the Echo? I had a really interesting conversation with Tony Fidel from Nest. You know, he said, you know, can you imagine the backlash if Google had put out a device that was always listening to you? The world wasn't ready. Amazon changed what we expected from technology and what we believed was possible. And then everybody jumped into the market. So there's going to be these moments that come in all of your businesses, where first, somebody will realize what's really possible today that was previously impossible. 
You know, that, that you could actually do this new thing of matching up passengers and drivers in real time, or that you could have a device that was always listening for its master's commands, right? And you may not be the first to do that, but you can be a, a fast follower. You can prepare yourself to understand that the future is coming at you and to be able to respond. So of course, Elon Musk, you know, master of thinking the unthinkable. I grew up as a kid imagining spaceships like in science fiction. They took up, they took off, and then they landed. Why did it take you know, 50, 60 years before somebody actually built one? You know, because Elon's like, hey, I think we can do this now. <laughs> and not only that, he basically, you know, his consistent pattern across all of his businesses is he knows that something is now possible. And he wants to show that it's possible so that everybody else gets working on it, which is, is really brilliant because he moves the industry forward in a sense with these giant demonstration projects which turn into real businesses. So as you focus on your business, you have to be like great entrepreneurs like Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk, asking yourself, what work needs doing and why aren't we doing it? You know, what's possible today? that was previously impossible. And that includes big questions about how work itself and the structure of companies is changing. So the second lesson that I came to from my years in the technology industry is that platforms have to create more value than they capture. I came into the industry when Microsoft was rising to dominance. And Microsoft's success was a byproduct of a moment in, of incredible generosity. That guy in the middle of the screen is a guy named Don Estridge, uh, who was in charge of IBM's personal computer division. And there was this new market, the microcomputer. Nobody really cared about it. It wasn't seen as a big, important market. So IBM wanted to rush and catch up. And Estridge came up with this remarkable idea. We're going to build a computer out of commodity parts that we're going to source from other people instead of building the whole thing at IBM. It'll get us to market faster. We'll even buy the operating system from someone else. Right? And then he gave away the specs. Anybody in the industry could make them. You know, Michael Dell started his company as a student at the University of Texas out of his dorm room. So there was this gift to the world. It was a, it was a sort of a gift that was based on a lack of understanding. Now, actually, these three different gifts I show here, uh, John von Neumann developed the original von Neumann architecture, which we take for granted in computing today at the Institute for Advanced Studies at Princeton as part of the research to build computers for the atomic bomb. And because it was government funded, it was put into the public domain. That was the first wave of computing. Then there's this sort of strategic mistake by IBM, which led to this explosion of innovation in the PC industry. And then, Tim Berners-Lee, research scientist, builds the World Wide Web, puts it into the public domain. Again, we're all off to the races. So that's the first thing. This act of generosity triggers this wave of innovation in the industry. And then uh, uh, companies come to uh, capture that value. And they take too much of it for themselves. Microsoft effectively ate the PC ecosystem. And that's when everybody went over to the web. And right now, we see this uh, situation where uh, um, you know, companies like Google and Facebook are facing the same ethical and business challenge. And my advice to every company that builds a robust ecosystem is preserve it. Invest in your customers. Invest in your competitors even. And I want to tell you a personal story about that from O'Reilly. Now, we started out as a, a technology uh, book publisher. And in 2000, this was the cover of, of Publishers Weekly. It says, the internet was built on O'Reilly books. And uh, people said, yeah, yeah, you know, we had, I had a number of tech billionaires who said to me, yeah, I started my company with one of your books. And I was telling this story at a, a company retreat, and my VP of marketing said, yeah, that should be our slogan. We create more value than we capture. And we've been saying that ever since. And we put that in practice when we launched Safari, which is our uh, online learning platform. It was originally an ebook platform. And and we launched it uh, right about that same time in 2000. And we invited in our biggest competitors into a joint venture with us. This is Pearson Technology Group. They literally had a group internally that they called the O'Reilly Killers. And we said, hey, you know, don't try to kill us. Come join us. 
because we believed at the time, and we still believe, that, that open standards are better. And we were trying to get everybody on board with e-books. And now, of course, we've continued that. We've tried to get everybody on board. As Safari has become more of a learning platform, we introduce new features. Like our, our, our current hot feature is live online training using Jupyter Notebooks. If you're not following Jupyter, it's a technology you should definitely be paying attention to. And we go out there and we evangelize to all our partners. You also should be developing live online training with Jupyter Notebooks. We don't do what Microsoft did or what Google did and say, hey, wow, we can get more of the share of the value from the platform if we introduce this feature and nobody else has it. Instead, we say, no, 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 let's give it to everybody so the platform stays vibrant for everybody who participates in it. So really important lesson, I think that, uh, Companies in tech forget this. And, and uh, it's it really interesting because uh, I've spent a lot of time with Satya Nadella at Microsoft as he's reinvigorating Microsoft. An amazing story of corporate transformation. And he just came out with a book a couple of weeks ago also. It's called Hit Refresh. I highly recommend it. And he says, when I became CEO, I sensed that we had forgotten how our talent for partnerships was a key to what make, made us great. Success caused people to unlearn the habits that made them successful in the first place. So the more successful you are, the more important it is to remember to continue to lift up your ecosystem. And that's why I'm really excited you know, to see that BMC has such a focus on partnership. Because understanding that a company is not just a company, it's a platform. It's at every level. You know, it's turtles all the way down. You know, all you people uh, who are from companies that are partners of BMC that depend on its platform, that depend on its services. You, in turn, have people, uh, other companies that depend on you. And you have to think about creating value for them as well. That's a key lesson from the rise and fall of computer platforms. Now, my next lesson is a way of going back to this idea of, of maps and what they teach us. And it's that change happens gradually, then suddenly. And I actually first used that phrase, and then somebody reminded me that, that uh, it was actually originally uh, uh, coined by uh, Ernest Hemingway in one of his novels, and he was using it about bankruptcy. And uh, a character is asked, uh, hey, Mike, how did, you, how did you go bankrupt? And the guy says, well, two ways, gradually, then suddenly. <laughs> and of course, this applies to technical debt <laughs> as well. You go bankrupt gradually, then suddenly. Uh, but it also applies uh, to innovation in general, uh, because the world changes gradually. And then there's a breakthrough, and suddenly everything is different. Right? So there's some really interesting history about this. And a fascinating book uh, that I highly recommend is, is called Learning by Doing by a guy named James Besson. He was a technology, he was a sort of a publish, electronic publishing entrepreneur in Boston. Uh, in the early 80s, I believe, and now he's an economics professor at, at Boston University. The book is about uh, what happened in the early days of the textile industry, and particularly in Lowell, Massachusetts, where the first fully integrated textile mills uh, were built in the 1840s. And he has interesting reflections that are very relevant for understanding the digital economy today. Because he understood that, it's, he, what he, he found out is that it's not just technology innovation, but the diffusion of knowledge about how to use it that makes a difference. You know, the, what happened when you went from the first invention of these, you know, the spinning jenny, and then the weaving machines, and then all the way up to these integrated factories, was this process of elaboration, of figuring out how all these things worked. The workflows changed. I mean, this uh, is an amazing diagram. It should probably, it's an eye chart. But that's the workflow of a, a modern, fabric mill, right, which is highly automated. There's dozens of specialized machines and complicated workflows. So people had to invent all kinds of new machines, new kinds of business processes. They had to learn them, you know, use them, fix them, improve them. And people had to learn all of the skills. Because one of the points that Besson makes, and this is very relevant to everybody who says, well, why can't we make another Silicon Valley? It's because you have a full workforce. You can't just have a small number of people with the skills. You have to be able to bring in new people uh, when you lose people. You have to have people who can advance the skills. And I've watched this throughout my own career. You know, there's a picture uh, uh, of Tim Berners-Lee's uh, you know, 1990 web architecture diagram, and was, here's a BMC web architecture diagram. And you, know, you think about the growing complexity. You know, in the early 90s, 
you know, one person. We had a term which has fallen out of, of use, the webmaster. Remember, the, remember when we talked about webmasters? There was one person who did everything related to a website. Now there's front-end engineers, back-end engineers, DevOps, site reliability engineering, security engineers, uh, you know, uh, SEO people, search engine marketing, uh, you know, not to mention you know, all of these new complex software machines that keep everything up, up and going. So we've gone through that same process, uh, you know, Tim Berners-Lee, this is the spinning jenny. You know, and we're starting to get you know, in the work of companies like BMC uh, up to that fully functioning uh, you know, software factory uh, equivalent to those uh, Lowell, milling, uh, Lowell uh, integrated mills. So we're at another inflection point though. You know, we're, we're now really you know, 30 years into the web and those technologies have become mature. Uh, I, I sometimes use the analogy of technology uh, and gravity. You know, you, think, you, you know how a, a, a very large, a massive object creates a distortion in the shape of space-time. That's sort of a description of how gravity works. And it's a great way to think about technology. You know, AI is, is actually distorting the fabric of, of our business space-time. It's changing the way things work. Things are going to fall into a new alignment. Uh, things like the echo, this idea that we're going to have speech as a first-class uh, interface. What does that mean? What does AI mean? You know, this is a talk uh, uh, from uh, Peter Norvig, which is, uh, you know, uh, all of our conference talks are uh, on Safari, but uh, this was at our AI conference in, in New York last year. We was really talking about how software engineering itself changes completely in the age of AI. So we're going to see enormous change. Right now, we're still in the gradually phase, but we're going to suddenly wake up, and it's going to be very, very, very different. So you need to prepare yourself. You need to be alert. You need to be listening and paying attention to these changes because you don't want to be bankrupt as opposed to changing gradually then suddenly. So here's what I see happening gradually then suddenly. Cloud computing, not just for tech companies. It's everywhere. Artificial intelligence and algorithmic systems, everywhere. In new kinds of partnerships with humans, the world is becoming digital, infused with the kind of technology that we thought, well, it's just in this realm that we call digital. And it's really just going to be the world. Right? So when I talk about new kinds of partnership with machines, uh, this is one of the earliest insights that I had uh, when I started thinking about what was different about the internet, was that the people were still inside the application. Now, in this particular case, in the data center, it's not very many people. But if you look at a company like Google, for example, or Facebook, and you think with a 20th century mindset, you'll, you'll imagine that all those workers, those programmers, are like factory workers, except they're producing code and algorithms instead of widgets. But if you really understand what's happening, the workers at these companies are programs. And those programmers are their managers. You know, they're basically continually taking in feedback from the market about what their workers are doing and whether it's, uh, doing, they're doing the right thing, giving them instruction in the form of updates. Right? And then there are even other uh, platforms where those algorithmic systems with human managers telling the algorithms what to do and the algorithms in, ten, in turn are telling humans what to do. You know, those drivers, show up here, pick up this passenger. Oh, wait, uh, you know, you, you're kicked off the platform because you haven't got good ratings. And so the modern company is increasingly becoming this cloud-infused network of humans, machines, in new kinds of configurations. You know, there's a passenger uh, with a, a smartphone, a driver with a smartphone. They're connected to a satellite giving the GPS signals. Oh, maybe there's going to be some self-driving cars in the mix. You know, and all managed through this data center. So the rules of business are changing profoundly. The, the number of people who work for a company is no longer even a sign of who's actually part of the application. So back to this idea of framing blindness. You know, we kind of keep updating our vision. You know, so we thought of cloud you know, computing version one. Well, it was just a server farm in the sky. 
And then it was DevOps. We understood that there were different business processes once you started to have that server farm in the sky. Now we're starting to talk about serverless computing and just these sort of being able to call services out of uh, some you know, cloud operating system. And I think perhaps version four is some kind of pervasive human machine symbiosis like we're starting to see in companies like, like Uber. So this next lesson is it's incredibly important as you grapple with new technology. Don't just recreate what went before. You have to take the opportunity to rethink business models, workflows, and processes. So think about Henry Ford. He didn't just invent you know, a better automobile. He invented a better factory. And then he actually invented things like the work week. It's like, oh, actually, we're going to give people two days off instead of one. You know, not just the Sabbath, because he wanted people to have a day when they could drive his cars. He wanted to pay people enough that the people who worked in his factories could buy his cars. And so this is wonderful uh, book. Again, I, I, I'm a publisher. I like recommending books even if I don't publish them. Uh, a wonderful little book from Harvard Business School Press called Who Do You Want Your Customers to Become? And it makes the point that great entrepreneurs actually envision a customer that does not exist yet. You know, that Google created a customer who just expects naturally that they can find the answer to any question at a moment's notice. That was something that used to be unthinkable. And we have to ask ourselves, who do we want our customers to become tomorrow, in the future? What will technology make possible, and why aren't we thinking of it? What's this framing blindness that's keeping us from doing that? And a, a great illustration, I, I know Uber is, is sort of a bad boy, and, and the, hopefully the change in management will uh, start to improve uh, what they do. There's still a, a great lesson, because they did rethink the way the world worked. And Aaron Levy of Box.com wrote this tweet three or four years ago, and it really struck me. He said, Uber is a multi-billion, I won't say it was 3.5, that tells you how long ago it was, $3.5 billion lesson in building for how the world should work instead of optimizing for how the world does work. In other words, don't just recreate the old, make it new, right? So as you do that, this is a really important lesson that I, I delve into in the book. Uh, and it's, this was something that was uh, told to me by some consultants that I brought into O'Reilly uh, back around 2000. Uh, and they said, a business model is the way that all the parts of a business work together to create competitive advantage and customer value. And as a way of illustrating that, they talked about Southwest Airlines. And they showed this map. right? And you think about business model. It's a term. You go, well, you know, Google and Facebook, they both use advertising. That's their business model. That's very shallow thinking. Southwest and United, they're both airlines. That's their business model. But Southwest makes super clear that you can do it very differently. They have limited passenger service. They have uh, you know, no baggage forwarding. They have point-to-point -point routes. You know, United, they have uh, you know, uh, you know, complex spoke and hub configurations. Uh, but what else does Southwest do? They actually invest in their employees very differently. They're heavily unionized. They, have, uh, 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 they have actually have fewer people. They have lean gate and ground crews, uh, really quick turnaround, uh, high stock employee ownership, because all of these things work together to make it possible for them to be the low fare airline. Right? And other airlines said, well, we're going to have a low fare airline. But they didn't have the whole business model, and so it never worked. Now, of course, Ryanair came along in Europe and came up with a totally different way to do it, which was you just be super cheap, and then you have all kinds of add-ons. And that's, I think, how our, uh, the rest of the airline industry caught up with Southwest by just adding lots and lots of fees. Um, but even now, Southwest is still more profitable uh, than any of the other airlines because they have a better business model. So when I started thinking about the current technologies, I decided to draw a business model map of Uber because I think for all that's wrong with it, I said it teaches us a lot about technology in the current economy. So the first thing that we all are very aware of is this magical user experience. How many of you here in the, in the audience actually use Uber or Lyft? Yeah, a good number of you. And uh, I, I, you know, it's less necessary in New York, but if you live in a place that doesn't have this density of taxi service, it's amazing that you can actually get a car at any time, at any place. And that is a magical experience made possible uh, by new technology. But it requires 
uh, this idea, again, who do you want your customers to become? They're very explicit that they want to see their customers replace ownership with access. They're platforms, not just you know, companies. All these people uh, who, who kind of come and go, people who work for both Uber and Lyft, and maybe if, if there are other options, those as well. You know, there's certainly black car drivers who work for their traditional uh, black car company as well. So it's a platform. And it's an algorithmic matching marketplace. The algorithms actually do this real-time matching of supply and demand. And the most important point that I like to point out is the workers are cognitively augmented. You know, you guys probably have heard about the knowledge. This is the, it's, it's short, that's short for the knowledge of the streets and monuments of London. It's the famously difficult exam that black cab drivers have to pass in London. It's really like being a human GPS. You know, the exam is, They'll give you a series of random points in London. You have to get from this one to this one, and you have to recite the turn-by-turn -turn directions for the most efficient route to get there. So, you know, you know I, I know somebody who actually took it, and it took him two years. This is a guy who was a former intelligence uh, officer in the British military, and when he retired, he said, I'm going to just do this for, for, uh, 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 you know, for stimulation. And you know, he said it was in, insanely hard. And uh, so, you know, but the reason this whole model works was because there's this new capability in our society, which is we have maps. And somebody figured out that that allowed anybody to do this job, right? Because maps and directions are now a new capability in our society. So you want to actually look for those things that make new things possible. But I also really want to talk about this marketplace issue. Uh, there's a wonderful book by Alvin Roth. He, he got a Nobel Prize for his work on matching marketplaces. Now, he was working on a really important matching marketplace. Uh, how do you improve uh, the, mar the market for matching kidney donors uh, with kidney recipients? And he had a real breakthrough in the way he designed that. But the book was pointed out to me by uh, the chief economist at Uber, who was really saying, this is my Bible. We're, we're fundamentally a matching marketplace. And it's really interesting, just understand to what extent you are a marketplace. Because I think that matching marketplaces are changing our economy in profound ways. You look at the rise of, of e-commerce over traditional retail, for example. They've found new ways to create matches. You look at the way that Google uh, and Facebook have risen as media empires because they found new ways uh, to match people algorithmically with the people who are looking for, for content. So, this understanding of, that, of business models also helps you understand how companies go wrong when they think, well, we'll just add the latest technology and it'll be our secret sauce. You know, so you see all these companies go, well, we'll just add an app for our taxi company. But the very thing that taxi companies hate about Uber and Lyft, which is all these unprofessional drivers, is what means that they can have supply at 2 a.m. in the morning, which means that they can have supply at you know, uh, at, uh, when, when the conference is getting out of the Javits Center, right? Because th they actually summon more people into the market using pricing algorithms when they need it. And so just adding an app that lets you, you know, hail a cab with your app doesn't matter if you don't have enough cabs. So understanding how all of the parts of your business fit together can give you insight into uh, why you can't just adopt technology uh, you know, as a standalone uh, silver bullet and makes you introspect about what is it in your business uh, that you have to do. And I think this kind of thinking is a great example of, uh, uh, of why Google was so successful with Android. They understood that their key business model depended on the access of users to information on demand. And suddenly there was this competitor, Apple, who was choking off the gateway to this information universe that they depended on. And if Apple had come to dominate the smartphone completely, this web universe that Google lived in was going to go away. And they made a strategic decision to open source, give away this enormous amount of value to a lot of partners, because it gave them the opportunity to preserve uh, their core business. So again, understanding how all the parts of your business work together, what the dependencies are, will lead you to you know, much smarter strategic decisions. So the other point I just want to make is on this platforms or marketplaces, they have to work for all their participants, not just for users. 
and not just for the marketplace owner. So this is a, a graph of the, the growing market share of Lyft against Uber. Uber looked so dominant. You know, they were valued at 10 times what Lyft was. Uh, but they had so many missteps. They treated their drivers badly. Uh, one thing after another uh, chipped away. And so you know, their customers started to turn away because they realized that the drivers mattered as well. And the drivers all started to switch. They all started using both platforms uniformly. I, I use Lyft all the time. They tell me, oh, we prefer it you know, to Uber because you have to make a marketplace work for both sides. So I already talked a little bit about this augmented worker idea. Uh, super important because it is the key to the growth in our economy. Uh, this graph shows what happened when Amazon put 45,000 robots into their warehouses uh, from 2014 to 20, middle of 2016. They hired 250,000 human workers. How did they do that? Well, I thought robots were supposed to take away the jobs. What happened was that Amazon didn't say, wow, we can do the same thing with fewer people. We'll just use more robots. They said, we can do more. We can pack, you know, I've talked to the Amazon warehousing people. They said, we can pack more products into the warehouse with these robots. We can speed up our workflows. So we can put more products on next day delivery. In fact, in a lot of zip codes, we can put products on same day delivery. So they, they, they used the technology to up the ante. So more robots meant more people. Because this is what Jeff calls the flywheel. You know, you basically get growth because you have a better customer experience that draws in more traffic, more sellers, more selection. You know, the lower cost structure, the lower prices, they all keep spinning this wheel faster and faster. And Jeff has spent, you know, now 22 years spinning the flywheel getting Amazon to be more and more powerful. He has not said, let's just do less with technology. He said, always. He's such a great entrepreneur because he says, let's do more. Do more. Right? This is the master design pattern for applying technology. Do more. Do things that were previously unimaginable. So when I hear that 47% of jobs are at risk of being automated in the next 20 years, I say, I don't buy it. You know, when I hear that we're going to need a universal basic income because there's going to be nothing left for humans to do, I don't buy it. And in fact, there's a lot of evidence. Uh, recently, an economist named Michael Mandel has actually shown that uh, jobs in warehousing and distribution from e-commerce are far outstripping the loss of jobs from retail that everybody's, uh, and, and those jobs, not only that, those, those jobs pay more. So we've forgotten the lessons of history. You know, that Luddite rebellion in 1811, uh, those weavers and the mill owners, they couldn't imagine the bounty that would come when people followed this design pattern of doing more. They couldn't imagine that ordinary people would have more clothing than the kings and queens of Europe. They couldn't imagine the bounty that you see in a supermarket that, that basically anybody, not just kings and queens, would have fruit in the middle of winter. Uh, they couldn't imagine we'd build a skyscraper a half mile high, that we'd go into space, that we'd split the atom, we'd fly through the air, we'd land on the moon. Hey, we build a tunnel between England and France. All of this was unimaginable. And so I want to ask everyone in business and in policy to ask, what is our failure of imagination? We're living in a world of enormous technological gifts. And all we can imagine is we're going to put people out of work? Forget it. No. You know, I want you to imagine humans treated as assets, not liabilities. I want to imagine an economy based on caring and creativity. Let the machines focus on the repetitive tasks. I want to think about how would that on-demand model that Uber and Lyft have shown us be applied to healthcare and education? You know, how might we imagine community health workers augmented with telemedicine and AI? Everyone has knowledge when they need it. Knowledge is built into the tools we use. We have fresh approaches to public policy based on what's possible now, rather than picking from just the same tired menus. Right? So in order to get to that world, continuous learning is a, a corporate imperative. You know, this is a, a picture from uh, my life. Uh, this is the Lissavagin uh, School about 1928. This is not really the first wave of the, of the Industrial Revolution. But it's particularly meaning the little boy on the end there is my father. And the, the, uh, the man with the beard on, on the end is, is uh, my great-grandfather. My actual grandfather was, uh, I guess, teaching a class inside. 
And when my dad died in 1982, he was carried to his grave in Ireland by some of the same uh, boys who were shoeless there, his classmates from his childhood. And they were still farmers. And he went on through education to become a famous research neurologist, the head of a neurology department at a great university, uh, uh, did you know, f seminal research on Parkinson's disease and uh, genetic dis diseases, nuclear medicine, because of education. So we made the world wealthy because we sent children to school instead of to the fields and factories. We did it again in the 20th century. Again, that, that photo was a little late. But we, you know, the high school movement, in 1909, 9% of US students went to high school. By 1935, it was 70%, because the people realized that their kids would not need to work on the farm anymore. And they rose to the challenge, and they said, we have to educate our children for the world of the future. After World War II, we sent returning veterans back to school. We invested in them, right? And now we have another challenge, and it was summarized beautifully by the former US ambassador to Australia, Jeffrey Blake. He's now the chair of the Fulbright Scholarship Board. And he said, if the students we're training today are going to live to be 120 years old, and their careers are likely to span 90 years, you know, this idea of retirement may go away, their training will only make them competitive for 10, we have a problem. And so I don't think we need to send, be sending, saying, oh, we've got to send more people to college so much as we need to be saying, in a world of knowledge on demand, how do we make continuous learning uh, something that happens all the time, and particularly in a work and corporate context? And that's a lot of what we've built, tried to build at O'Reilly. Safari has become a platform for learning. You know, we have an expert network, live training, uh, ebooks, video, whatever you need. But the point is, we're trying to, to build this resource for continuous education. And so, um, and I want to just kind of underline how important this is, uh, even from a financial success point of view. This is just not a moral question. Uh, Larry Fink, who's the CEO of BlackRock, the world's largest investment manager, in his uh, 2017 letter to investors uh, wrote, in order to fully reap the benefits of a changing economy and sustain growth over the long term, businesses will need to increase the earning potential of the workers who drive returns, helping the employee who once operated a machine learn to program it. They must improve their capacity for internal training and education to compete for talent in today's economy and fulfill their responsibilities to their employees. The great companies of today always invest in their employees. They always create opportunities for people to learn and grow. And I think it's, it's super important for us to understand that what we do as a company, what we do for our own employees, is also writ large what we have to do for society. So because we get the economy we ask for. You know, it isn't technology that wants to eliminate jobs. My friend Nick Hanauer said, Prosperity in human societies is best understood as the accumulation of solutions to human problems. We won't run out of work until we run out of problems, right? And the, the thing that's really interesting is technology, particularly the great digital technologies, give us an opportunity to understand what we're asking for. You know, when I look at a site like Google or Facebook, I, I use the analogy in my book that the digital programs that, the, that run these uh, uh, companies are really like the genies of Arabian mythology. They do exactly what we tell them to do. We don't always just ask them the right things. You guys all know the story of, you know, you get to the three wishes, and the story always hinges on the fact that somebody asks for the wrong thing. If you saw Walt Disney's Fantasia, that's also about that, you know, Mickey Mouse with the broomsticks. You know, he says, you know, I want this, you know, spell to help the, get the brooms to help me with my chores, and they go, they go haywire, a little bit like uh, all the, the fears of AI going haywire. But we see this today. We can see that Facebook, they had this idea of what, they were going to tell their digital genies what to do. They were going to say, show people more of what they want. Show people more of what they like, what they click on, what they share. They didn't mean to encourage hyperpartisanship. They didn't mean uh, to affect uh, our election. But that's what happened. And I think in a similar way, we have to actually look into what we're really asking our technology to do. 
This is a friend of mine, uh, now deceased, who in the early days of Macintosh programming uh, said to me, the art of debugging is figuring out what you really told your program to do rather than what you thought you told it to do, <laughs> right? And uh, we have to actually think that about all of our technologies because it seems to me that one of the reasons why we're stuck on this idea of technology uh, eliminating jobs is because that's what we're telling it to do. You know, uh, when Milton Friedman in 1970 said the social responsibility of business is to increase its profits, he didn't mean to tell companies that, well, you know, do whatever it takes uh, to increase your profits. But that is kind of what happened in the same way that Facebook. You know, we can see it with Facebook. We can see that they didn't quite get what they wanted. We have to realize that about the economy as a whole. And we have to commit ourselves to putting our technologies and our companies to work, investing in people, solving hard problems, making the world better. And, and that's why the most important word in the title of my book are not WTF, but it's up to us. So make better choices, build a great company, build a great economy. Thank you. Really, thank you very much. Right, Michael, Real pleasure. Thank Thanks a lot. Thanks very much, Tim. Tim, as we started actually our day today, we talked about technology and all the things we're bringing to market and excited about. But we said it's also about process and finally about people. So the people that are in the room are the people that have it in our hands to think differently about what we can do with technology. We're very excited to have folks like Tim work with us. We're very excited to have you here. I'm also excited to have our customers here to share about what they're doing with technology, how they're thinking differently about their business models and driving digital transformation. To, to host those uh, great customers who are going to share their ideas, I'd like to invite up to stage, uh, let's make sure I've got the correct slide, Mr. Herb Van Hook, our Vice President of Digital Strategy and Innovation. Herb, please come up to the stage. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I've got a really great privilege now. I'm going to have some of uh, our great BMC customers come up and join me on stage for a few minutes. We're going to talk a little bit about how they use BMC technology to enable success in their companies. So with that, uh, let me have the panel come up. I have Dan Chase from Fiserv, uh, Chris Haynes, Chris from Raymond James, and David Trainer from Southern Company. Please give them a great welcome. Yeah, second chair. Okay, guys, thanks a lot for joining us today. You're welcome. Good to be here. <clears throat> the greatest city in the world, right? Exactly. Okay, there we go. Had to correct Dan's statement from earlier. What was that? <laughs> Danny said, one of the greatest. I say it's the greatest yes, city. Yes, that's correct. <laughs> So I'll tell you what, we're going to start at the far end down there. Uh, David, I know you're a little tight on time today, so I'm going to start with you and uh, we'll talk a little bit and then, then I'm going to let you go off stage, okay? Okay, works great, great, great. So David's with Southern Company. Uh, Southern Company is a energy provider, uh, mostly in the Southeast United States, based out of Atlanta. Uh, they provide electricity to over 9 million customers as well as natural gas. They have a huge, huge uh, network there. They've got over 200,000 miles of power lines. They've got about 80,000 mile, 80, miles of uh, pipeline, mm -hmm. a lot of Internet of Things kind of going on in your future probably. Yeah. Uh, David is actually the head of all service management for Southern Company. You've got uh, the service test proper as well as service strategy, uh, as well as things, uh, use of analytics in that area, things like that. So, David, a little bit uh, about what you do there. So, everyone knows there's a lot of dynamic changes going on in the utility industry. What are you seeing, actually, at, at Southern Company? Yeah, there's a major change in how we make, move, sell electricity. And we've seen flat to declining uh, demand, which means less revenue, which means cost pressures. And that's being driven by technology, it's being driven by energy efficiency, things like Nest thermostats. They start to give control over how they use our product. So we've uh, gone out, acquired a gas company to try to expand our customer base. But the bigger deal was uh, a company we partner with that uh, 
where it's beyond the meter. That's where the products and services are, where we can find new revenue growth, new opportunities to serve our customers and offer more value to them moving forward, that we can take advantage of those technologies as uh, the world evolves. Okay. A lot of disruption in the industry and everything <clears throat> that Peter talked about today, we're facing directly. Okay, great, great. And by the way, I know, I know you guys are a big user of Remedy. Uh, you did a Remedy 9.1 upgrade this yeah. last year. Can you tell us a little bit about that and how that went? Did you use BMC to do that or did you use a, a partner? Or how, did, how did you do that? Primarily inside our work group, but we offer, also work with BMC for some of our issues that would pop up for the expertise. Um, it went seamlessly. We were able to utilize some of the overlays we did for the last upgrade. And, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, when we, you know, sometimes you hold your breath when you have to roll out something new. And when we pulled the trigger the next day, there was no... Nobody died, nothing bad happened, the power didn't go <laughs> off, and uh, people saw improvements versus the negative where they can't do what they need to do the next well, that's, day. That's great, that's great. And I know actually uh, you guys are, are really a big user of uh, BMC's digital workplace solutions. So I'd like to share with you, uh, I'd like you to share with us a little bit about uh, how extensive you use that and, and really what you use it for. How's, how's that changed the way your employees work? Yeah, and, and the utility industry is very uh, tenured. I've got 30 plus years with the company and most meetings I'm not the oldest person in the room. So it's uh, a lot of people have been there before me and so we're seeing a change in the demographics. People are starting to retire. So we're seeing new employees come in that are used to technology. They want to use their phone. They don't want to call us. So we've really made investments on self-service, uh, update the knowledge base request forms that are automated and being able to offer other ways to get service and support they need to do their jobs because that's what's most important. We're dealing with uh, internal customers, but those internal customers are dealing with the paying customers and we want to make them as efficient as possible. So we've got um, you know, over 300 request forms. We've got thousands of solutions in the knowledge base. We've got automation behind some of those knowledge base solutions. Uh, 15,000 unique users, uh, everything's consolidated within, I'll call it MIT, all the new name changes make things uh, challenging for us, but 70% uh, of our contacts to our service desk are through MIT, and so that's using the knowledge base, that's using the request forms, and we want to make that grow. Uh, we've been able to decrease call volume to our service desk over 30% because we've offered these self-service opportunities, and we got to build on that because mm -hmm. The demand, the <clears throat> desire is there in our customer base. Were we were using anything for self-service at all before? Or? Yeah, we were on the dark side. We had some uh, ServiceNow products and services we were using. <laughs> so, uh, uh, we are using that for the knowledge base and everything was consolidated uh, within MIT. And uh, like I said, power did not even flicker when we made that change. And uh, <laughs> so life has been good. Uh, that's great, that's great. So why don't you comment just a little bit on what you see as the future. I'd mentioned Internet of Things a little bit, mm -hmm. and I know that um, this other company is really getting big into the Smart Cities initiatives. There's been a lot of announcements come out the last year. What, what do you see on the, the horizon for that? Yeah, and actually one of the Smart Cities is in my neighborhood. I drive by it to and from work every day. They're just uh, constructing the homes. they got high-speed Internet coming in. They've built a solar array to provide power for those uh, homes backup power because it doesn't always, sun doesn't always shine, so you do have to have the backup power. But it's also enabling a lot of smart devices in the home, the ability for us to test out some of that behind the meter products and services and see what resonates with uh, that uh, neighborhood. So we can see a lot of that in the future as we move forward. And from us uh, within the technology organization, very interested and very encouraged by what we heard today with the uh, AI because that's something we see as a huge opportunity for us on how we provide services internally to our business partners across Southern companies. So we'd like to do more on the chat side, <laughs> RPA, AI, and being able to uh, drive efficiencies and uh, you know, let's decrease some of the core we do for those day-to-day -day foundational so we can free up resources to work on those new products and services we need to drive our business forward. Okay. Hey, thanks a bunch. And David, I know you've got a plane to catch, so uh, we're going to uh, ask the audience uh, sort of patience here and, and let David go on okay. exit street. Thank you. Dry. Hey. Thanks so much. Uh, Chris, I think I'm going to go to you next. You're, you're there in the center. All righty. Um, so Chris is with Raymond James Financial. 
Uh, Raymond James Financial is an uh, American diversified uh, you know, financial services firm. It's a holding company for a lot of subsidiaries, very heavy into investment banking, uh, trading, things like that, uh, asset management, et cetera. Chris actually runs a team that deals with uh, all of uh, workload engineering there. And uh, I think you've been there, what, about five years now? So no, I've been there 16 years. I've been 16, in the, oh, been uh, in this uh, role five years. Okay, great. And uh, their environment has a lot of complex integration points. Uh, they have a lot of increasing demand because of this complexity around workload coordination, data coordination, things like that. So, uh, Chris, why don't you tell us just a little bit about how uh, Control M, which is the workload automation solution you're using, is really critical to business here at Raymond James. Right, and as you said, uh, the complexities continue to grow, the demand grows. Um, what Control M really does for us, it provides a simplified insight into that, into everything there. So we're able to really see things uh, in real time and view it, break things out so, so people understand what's coming. Um, we, we're using lots of pieces of the tool, the forecasting, so we know ahead of time any impact of the business applications a day before or, or however far ahead you want to forecast. Um, and then we're very excited some of the future stuff we're, we're uh, stepping, we just got MFT. Uh, that's going to be another game changer for us um, because file transfers drive a great deal of our workload. Okay, so uh, this morning actually, uh, Bill had a number of customers we were talking about that we had partnered with and worked with on developing new technologies. And Raymond James has actually been one of those great partners uh, in this particular area. They've worked with us both on developing the archiving capabilities around Control M as well as the managed file transfer capabilities. I'd like you to tell a little bit about your experience in terms of working with BMC on that. So one of the, the terms of partnership is exactly what it is. Um, it's, it's really a great relationship. And those two instances you uh, talked about, MFT and, and the archiving, we had actual uh, folks from BMC from R&D came to our place, worked with my team. We, you don't get a lot of times where you're working with the folks that are architecting that tool and get the insights, and then they're looking for your feedback on how to improve it before it goes to the street. And that, that's really, to me, speaks volumes about that being a true partnership with BMC. Okay, great, great. And by the way, I think you guys push about 4 million jobs a month through right now? Yep. Something like so, that. So, and and so that's growing, yeah, are... yeah, it's continuing to grow, and that's about a million job uh, executions growth in like less than six months. So we're jumping, jumping and jumping, So and, it, and I don't see any slowdown, so. Okay, thanks very much. And then next to me here is Dan Chase. Dan is with Fiserv. He's director of IT service management there, but really has some very, very distinct roles. Fiserv, by the way, is a fintech company, right? It's Correct. a financial services technology firm. Um, they, they have about 12,000 plus organizations they serve, yes. customers they sure serve. Uh, I think about 23,000 employees at Fiserv. Yes, that's correct. Right? And, and uh, one of the, and, and Fiserv, by the way, is really very well known. They won a lot of awards for things like their mobile payments platform. Uh, they're very big in data and analytics. Uh, but they sell back to basically any place where money has to be moved. Correct. Right? They yes. sell into those industries. So uh, one of the things Dan's worked on recently is he's responsible for essentially all of IT asset management and configuration management and a big user of BMC's discovery technology. So I'd, I'd like to, to ask him now to share a little bit about what he's doing there around asset governance, process governance, and then how the technology helps with that. Sure. Certainly. So at, at Fiserv, much like any other fintech companies, security is very important to us, knowing where our assets are running, what they're doing, who's running on them, because those assets do move multiple billions of dollars uh, of your guys' money, of our customers' money. It's very important to understand uh, what's your uptime and how all the systems that, that provide that uptime are related. So if we do have, for example, a service interruption or a service outage, we know exactly who to page, what the problem is, and also how to notify our customers as well, not to over notify our customers for, for, uh, for a potential outage, but to target it based on the particular product that we've modeled, the application model, or the infrastructure that supports it. 
So that, that's one case. Uh, we're also leveraged discovery quite heavily to make our CMDB the source of truth, the source of record for things to reference when we do process changes. So as a change is approved, one of our policies is to make sure we have a configuration item related or attached to that change. All of those configuration items, they come in via the BMC discovery solution. That way, and we've actually learned a lot by doing that. We've learned not only what we are changing, for example, if a change is to, to modify code on a specific set of web servers, we also have learned through relationships that we could also inadvertently impact another set of web servers for a different application as well. So we've learned to change smarter. We've learned to be more agile with the changes we are making and just be more aware of what's out there in our environment. And also, in addition to more, more on the governance side, we, it helps us to enforce a lot of our policies around <coughs> making sure if it's running, if it's being moved on a raised floor, is there an approved change request to put it on the raised floor or to take it off? We'll know through BMC discovery pretty quickly if something came on that we weren't expecting, or for example, if something left that we still expected to run there, the, the discovery scans will run, it will show that either A, there's a new device on the floor, how did it get there, or another example, this device was scanned yesterday, it's no longer there, where did it go? And especially if it's, if it's a physical asset, that's even more concerning yeah. as well. We want to make sure that we know, again, whether it's physical or virtual, whatever type of infrastructure it is, we know exactly where it is and what it's doing at all times. And that's how the discovery solution helps us do that. Yeah, you know, and from talking to you, I understand that, that you're probably managing uh, kind of a constant update of over like 20,000 endpoints Correct. and infrastructure elements. Yes. Those are modeled into a set of services, applications they that, are. that you track. In yes. this. So that's great. Now, this morning we actually heard about discovery for multi-cloud quite a bit. Are, are you being challenged or, or looking to discover things that are sort of outside the four walls of Fiserv? Yes, we, we definitely are. We're even challenged within the four walls of Fiserv. So I'll kind of start there first. We, in some of our larger data centers, we're running uh, software-defined data centers, almost uh, individual compartments within, within a physical building. So we're challenged to not just discover what you can see and touch in one location, but there might be assets in different compartments, so to speak, in the same building. But you're, you're exactly right, Herb. We're, we're looking out to uh, other, other providers that run applications that support our users, our internal users that are in the cloud. Uh, we're, we're also being challenged to know what assets run there on our behalf. One of, one of my favorite sayings is discovery can no longer start at the firewall and it can no longer stop at the firewall. We've got to be accountable and understand what's out there and what's running because at the end of the day, when we manage our users' money, we transfer billions of dollars in funds, it's no longer good enough to say, well, that's not in a FISERV managed data center. We don't have to worry about that. We do have to worry about it because it's, it's our product, it's our brand that's out there. So definitely being challenged, challenged in a number of ways, but it's a challenge that quite honestly with, with the discovery solution and what we've seen today with multi-cloud, I'm very confident we can address that challenge. That's great. Yeah, we live in a connected world, right? Without a doubt. <laughs> okay, with that, I'd like to thank Dan and Chris so much and also David. So please join me in, in thanking them for sharing their experiences. <laughs> Thanks a lot, guys. <laughs> you guys can, you wanna go off that way? Thanks a lot. Okay, it's my pleasure now to bring up a good friend of mine and uh, Vice President of Sales here at BMC is Jeff Hardy and he's got some very special announcements for us. Jeff? So good morning everyone. It's, um, it's exciting to see so many customers and partners and distinguished guests here today. It's my distinct pleasure to introduce you to the finalists for the 2017 BMC Innovation Awards. So each year, uh, let me see if we can advance this, great. Each year we recognize several customers for their exceptional work in leveraging BMC technologies to solve their company's most pressing business and technology problems. And while we love celebrating our customers' success, I also hope that for those of you joining us here today that this is instructive um, to show you what's practical as well as inspirational to see what's possible. Uh, the BMC Innovation Award is determined by acclamation across a pool of nominations submitted by BMC sales, engineering, our customer success organi organization, as well as our product management organizations. Um, this year, uh, we're gonna concentrate on two 
nominations or two finalists as well as our overall BMC Innovation Award and so I want to get out of my own reveal here. Um, but I'd like to announce and congratulate the 2017 finalists for the BMC Innovation Award. Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center and PNC Bank. Please give them a warm round of applause. So uh, just real quick, I'd like to give you a quick idea of what both these great organizations have accomplished. Um, so PNC Bank uh, has done an incredible job of addressing a number of challenges related to their next generation data center initiative. They've adopted our SecOps and performance and availability solutions, um, which has allowed them to, do, to ensure compliance and reduce vulnerabilities to a point where they've been so successful, they've reduced by half uh, the number of uh, critical vulnerabilities in their server environment within the first two months of their project and are now instrumenting their network estate with the same capabilities. They're also improving their availability of their critical business services by reducing complexity and standardizing on the TrueSite operations management suite and moving to a much more proactive event management paradigm that'll help them drive speed and agility and reduce the time needed to resolve incidents from hours to minutes to seconds. So way to go, PNC Bank. Now Memorial Sloan Kettering, as most of you likely know, rapidly delivers services to doctors, patients, researchers, and staff. They leverage our discovery solution to both find and map their critical business services, and then they leverage those service and application views across their SecOps, performance and availability, and service management portfolios to rapidly fulfill requests and ensure availability. They're driving efficiencies and reducing manual errors by automating wherever possible, and they've reduced their time to determine root cause of issues as well as remediating vulnerabilities faster than ever before and ensuring compliance and reducing risk throughout the organization. So congratulations to Memorial Sloan Kettering. Now, with that, I'd like to ask Dan Streetman to come back to the stage to award our 2017 BMC Innovation Award. Thanks very much, Jeff. Appreciate it. Um, I'm very excited to announce our Innovation Award winner. This company is a great company to reward for a couple of key reasons. But one for me is, their fa my favorite piece is their mission. Their mission is to discover and provide innovative solutions that save and improve lives. Their code of conduct actually begins with a patient's first credo that to me is inspiring. And of course, just as inspiring is the tech innovation they're using to drive employee and partner experience. They've consolidated their service under a single service portal. They've actually delivered fulfillment with digital workplace, Remedy, TrueSight, and automation platforms. All of this is driving a new user experience, which we expect to reduce their call volume into their call center and their service desk by over 30%. So I'd love to actually welcome to the stage Mr. Peter Leave to help me present our Innovation Award winner for 2017 award to Merck. And Drew Kimberlin, could you please come on up? Right, congratulations. Now we're going to do a mandatory photo op here. Close to the camera. Congratulations, Drew. Really good. Awesome. Thank hey, thanks everybody for that welcome and that congratulations. We are very uh, thrilled all of you have stayed with us. We've had a quick adjustment to the schedule. So if you'd like, you can actually pull out your BMC app. I'll do a quick demo here on stage. Swipe down. And you'll see everything is adjusted by about 30, by exactly 30 minutes in your schedule. So your BMC app still has everything you need to see what's going on, all our breakouts. But if you're working off paper or something else that you've written down, we're just 30 minutes off and we'll continue to make a, a quick close. Our lunch options, which are gonna go from 1 to 2 p.m. now, will include a networking lunch, which is right outside the keynote. Uh, we also welcome everyone to attend our diversity and technology lunch. Dinal Limbakia will be representing the United Nations He for She program. That's gonna be right outside. You can follow signage out there. You can interview the registration desk. You can read more about Dinal in the event app. Again, a good place to understand Seating is limited for that, so we ask those of you who are very interested, please follow the signs and go out and uh, listen to Denal. She's got a great program working on He for She. It's got a 10 by 10 by 10 program where 10 world leaders in the UN 
are each driving 10 initiatives to drive gender diversity and gender inclusion, uh, and it's great. We're really excited about that. So that'll be a great way to get, uh, to get our lunch. I'm sure everybody's hungry right now. In our afternoon sessions, we will do digital service management breakouts right here in this keynote room. We'll have digital business automation, performance and analytics, security, compliance, and automation all, uh, all downstairs in our breakout rooms. So we're excited about that. We have customer speakers, more roadmap presentations. Again, everything you need to see is right here in the BMC event app. While you're also gathering lunch and in between those breakout sessions, finally, please remember to get your card stamped by our sponsors for a chance to win some great prizes. More importantly, to learn what they're doing to partner with BMC to drive innovation and ensure your success. It's a great opportunity to work with them. They're all, uh, most of them are outside here. There are also some downstairs outside the breakout rooms. So I thank our sponsors and our partners once again, but most importantly, I thank you. As we said, we're driving great technology. We are bringing first to market innovation. We're partnering with great leaders. So I thank Bina and I thank Beth for being here. I thank our customers who've spoken today, but I thank you who are investing not just in the technology, but in understanding what happens with the process and what happens with the people. And those part take leaders. Leaders who take time out of their day to invest in their education, to invest in hearing great speakers like Tim, and to work closely with us so that we can hear you. And as Peter said, we want to hear what we're doing well, we want to hear what we can do more of, and we absolutely want to hear what we can improve. So please share that with us throughout the day. Have a very powerful afternoon. We're now done with this session, and we look forward to seeing you throughout the rest of the day. Thank you.